Welcome back to another episode of the Working Class Fishing Podcast. My name is Brian Keachley. I'm here with uh, John Morris. We both host this podcast. And today we are going to talk about building on a budget. And building on a budget really is going to encompass getting what you need to get out on the water and fish for a reasonable price and, and reasonable quality and, and all the other good stuff that you need to take into consideration when you are getting ready to hit the water for the first time, or maybe uh, you already have a budget set up and you want to upgrade a little bit. Uh, John's done a lot of research on this, and, and so he's put it together a really good uh, compilation of notes and everything else. We'll probably end up putting this in the um, show notes uh, links, and you'll be able to also find these links on Instagram uh, and on the YouTube video here as well. And uh, we're going to talk about gear and baits basically today, terminal tackles. Uh, so spin gear, casting gear, fly gear, terminal tackle, plastics, live bait, flies, raising your own bait, which is actually a really cool thing to do. The simplicity of fishing lures and quality versus quantity. So you got all that great stuff that we're going to be talking about today. If you haven't already, make sure you tell your friends about this podcast. Uh, you can find us on most major platforms now. Uh, and then we also have our YouTube channel, which you, if you're watching this video, you're probably on our YouTube channel right now. And so we uh, really appreciate all the support so far. You guys have been awesome. Some great feedback, great input from everybody. And we really want to make sure that uh, all of you are included as a part of this. So if you have future show ideas, make sure to shoot those over. So uh, now that all that formality is out of the way, John, I'm going to turn this over to you and, and let you do a little bit of the breakdown of what we got going on here. So looks like we're going to start out with uh, some spin gear, but uh, overall, what, what's kind of your ideas of, uh, you know, getting yourself set up to start? Well, hey, everybody, I'm John. And, you know, just the, let, let me start out with this, okay? Uh, most of what we're talking about is going to be around the hundred dollar price range. Uh, not, I said most, not all of it. Okay. So don't be like, Whoa, that's it. And for me, um, j just taking into consideration that that is a decent enough price range to get you something that's going to last. Um, you can go out and get a lot of really cheap things. that will get you on the water right now. And there's nothing wrong with that. All right. But if you're really looking like Brian said in the opening, if, if maybe you, you're already a fisherman or a fisherwoman or angler, however you'd like to be called, uh, there's there's a chance you already have some gear. Maybe you're looking to upgrade. Well, this this is probably for you. Uh, if you're looking for, we've got some rods even, rod and reel combos even in the $30 and you know $25 range. Uh, we've got stuff for everybody here, but keep in mind most of our content here will be based on the $100 to some even a little bit over but you're really going to get your money's worth. Um, so starting out, all you need is rod, reel, line, and that's really it. Uh, baits, you can get little little tackle box packs of like panfish baits, panfish jigs, and stuff like that, and you can catch bass, you can catch panfish, you can catch catfish, all that stuff on those baits. It doesn't take tons of things to really get out there and catch fish, okay? Uh, but what we're really breaking down, majority of our focus today is going to be on the rods and reels. And then we're going to trickle on down and give some thoughts and opinions and some uh, probably less than factual statements on some of these. But we'll, we'll figure out what we can. And um, I didn't take the time to write down all the special case specifications for these reels. Uh, it would have taken a long time. I'll, I'll do that before this gets posted on YouTube so you can go to the PDF or whatever and view those. If you're curious about that, if you're a number nut like I am, I love analytics and numbers. So uh, we'll go ahead and get started into the spin gear. Okay, so when I think spinning gear, the very first rod I think of that is friendly for your everyday angler, your working class angler, is the Ugly Stick GX2. All right, the Ugly Stick GX2 is... Uh, readily accessible at, you know, Academy, Dick's, Walmart, uh, places like that. Really, really accessible. It sits around, it, it depends on what time of the year it is, but typically sits around $35 to $45. Uh, it, it comes with a, a seven foot rod, uh, all the way, I believe, down to a 6.6. Six. Let me see if I wrote that down. To a 6.5, six and a half foot, all the way up to a 7.2. 
uh, meaning seven foot two inch rod. Uh, it comes in medium heavy. Uh, the t it's really fast action. Let me tell you, you can't beat this rod. It comes with line. Uh, generally, I try to replace any line that comes on a brand new reel. Uh, the line uh, could be sun damaged. It could just be has a ton of line memory in it. That's no fun. Uh, you cast out, and first thing that happens is just your reel just blows up. The spool just yep. comes apart. And then you spend the next 10 or 15 minutes digging all that out. And then you're like, well, all my line's gone, and I hate today. It's just no fun, right? So um, I would recommend getting some line. It doesn't have to be expensive, but it needs to be new. Okay. Uh, so Ugly Stick GX2 sits around $45 range. Um, that's in spin gear. And they have recently released a $70 GX2 bait cast combo. Same specific specifications on the rods. And then uh, the reels. I don't have a lot of experience with that reel specifically, but uh, judging from rod composition to the reel, I'd say it sits on average or on par with probably the Abu Garcia Black Max. Now, I don't know that for a fact because I haven't owned that reel, but I have owned the Black Max, okay? Um, the next one we're going to get into is the Casking Crixus. Casking Crixus is going to depend on it's between seventy to hundred dollar range. Okay, so the Crixus is a five six light all the way up to a seven foot medium heavy. Those are your rod selections. The actual reel itself has a seventeen point six pounds of drag. A very very sturdy. You could even use this in the salt if you wanted to. I wouldn't recommend it. It's not a sealed drag system, but you could as long as you wash it out really well and take care of it. You know, wash it out, re lube it it's still eventually over time, if it's using the salt, it's going to corrode. Uh, you just, you can't, you can't get around that. It's not a sealed drag system, but it can handle surf fish to an extent. It's got a really good drag. Um, and it, it fits all the ranges. You know, you, you've got your light, light rods for finesse fishing and, you know, uh, ultralight fishing all the way up to medium heavy to where you can catch bass and whatever you want on them pretty much. All right, and then you've got the Cadence CC5. The Cadence CC5 falls under the exact same range as the Crixus. It's the 70 to 100 and is honestly just about completely comparable to the Cast King Crixus in itself. Um, it has different colors. It has a little different drag system. But um, mainly, I, I kind of threw that in there for color because a lot of people like to be like, oh, well, I want this rod color, this rod color. Uh, they're incredibly comparable. But the next one, this one kind of threw me for a loop. I wasn't ready for this. I didn't know this was out. This just came out this year. It's the Daiwa D-Shock. Okay, I'm a huge Daiwa and Shimano fanboy. I don't know what it is, but I love them. The Daiwa D-Shock is $30. That is, that's incredibly affordable. Yeah, that is. Uh, you know, if you save 60 cents a day for a month, you can afford this rod. All right, so that ain't too bad, right? Um. The, speci uh, the speci specifications, man, I got problems with that word. Um, it comes from a light all the way up to medium heavy as well. And that's if you're ordering it online. Now, given, I, I can tell you that you can get them in light and all this stuff. Well, this is all from online, what I was looking at. If you go to your store, they might not have all those selections. Uh, I'm going to say this. If you can only get one weight rod, get a medium heavy. If you can only get one weight, get a medium heavy. If you're only, if you're planning on cat fishing and bottom fishing a lot, I'd go ahead and bump that up to a heavy. If you're only going to be throwing smaller moving baits, go ahead and make that a medium. But if you only had one, get a medium heavy. All right, Brian, do you have any, uh, any recommendations on spin gear? So, um, predominant way that, that we do, uh, quite a bit of angling, uh, around here is no different than anywhere else. And the way that I look at spin gear and all these rod combos are absolutely fantastic that John's found. Uh, not only are they affordable, but they're easy to learn how to use. And I want to echo the sediment that John said, when you get one of these combos, that, so you go get the rod and the reel combo all together, really re just replace the line. It doesn't have to be expensive line. It can be uh, the, the penny per yard monofilament. And, and the idea behind that is uh, John brought up uh, casting memory or, or line memory. And so the memory of a line is the coils that form in the line. It happens to anything that's wrapped around a circumferential type device, like a drag. So 
uh, it happens with metals. It happens with uh, uh, different types of uh, lines and, and wire and all kinds of stuff. So nothing really can avoid that. When they wind that on, it's wound on at a factory under a very high amount of tension because it's got to happen fast. They're, they're building these and they're, you know, times money, everything else. But the first thing that happens to the majority of people, and I know this from my past experience working in outdoor stores and all that, is they go out and they put maybe a little bit too light of something on there, light a tackle. And, and, you know, that should never really matter. You should be able to fish as light as possible, but they cast out and the thing explodes like a bird's nest. It, it can happen to the best of us even. So the, really important that you just get rid of all that line and, and replace it right out of the gate there. I'm a Daiwa fan too. I, I fish all my bass fishing stuff is Daiwa. Uh, and then uh, I run Shimano reels too. But uh, huh. this, this one from Daiwa, the D-Shock, I don't think that you would ever be disappointed. And a medium heavy rod to start is perfectly acceptable because as you're learning lure weights and casting technique and everything else, you don't want to go too light because you risk uh, having a hard time casting, even breaking the rod, things like that. As you're learning how to, to weight your terminal tackle correctly. You can break a rod really easy by, uh, you know, cracking it out there and, and it'll snap right where the, the joint comes together. If it's a two piece rod or you can break a tip off or something. So these three combos, uh, the ugly stick is like an American standard. You can get ugly sticks in, in the smaller combos like this clear up into surf rods and Shakespeare, uh, for years and years and years has made just a fantastic, working person's uh, rod unequivocal to anything else you know i i've seen more sturgeon caught on tiger sticks and the big surf ugly yep. sticks and things like that and they hold up that it's not garbage it's good stuff yes it's foreign made but it's also very affordable i see more of those rods out on the river than i do of the really high-end rods so these, these are fantastic rods john i think i think uh you know for anybody when you're ready to step up to the next level, even the 70 to $100 combination is not a bad combo to go with. And that one's actually going to give you even better life. So if you can squeak out the extra few bucks, then, then definitely step up. But if you're, if you're really income restricted, this is, these are great here. Yeah. I can't recommend the Shakespeare and the Daiwa products enough. I'm not too familiar with the other ones, but um, you know, from, from my experience fishing around here, that's good. And then the saltwater stuff, if you're really going to get into saltwater fishing, you will want to step up and invest in that sealed drag reel, but you can get away with it with, uh, you know, growing up here, fishing the, the, the coast, uh, we, we didn't have sealed drag reels. We, we got the combos and we'd go pitch them out. And the big thing was we got out the garden hose and flushed them out really good after yep. we were done and, and they don't last forever, but it, we were still able to go out and get, you know, quite a few years of fishing out of it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, to add on to that. So, uh, Shakespeare going back to the, that company somewhat Shakespeare makes an excellent youth spinning combo as well. Um, as a recommendation, uh, th this should probably go in one of our later episodes on, um, you know, getting your family into fishing, but I'm going to go ahead and say it now. Um, a youth spinning combo is better than a push button youth combo. Um, it teaches better mechanics. They cast better. It's easier to fix. Um, just outright, it's easier to fix because you can see what's going on you don't have to take everything off it's literally just like okay well it's wrapped this much maybe i've got to cut the line maybe i can just unravel it and then you know hold it and then spin it back up it, it teaches better mechanical skills the learning curve is not that much different uh, i never taught my son how to use a push button rod a rod and reel uh, the, the quality on those don't get me wrong zebco makes a great push button rod and reel i was going to suggest that but these are more of the open cast spinning combos. Uh, I'm a firm believer that these are better quality and they have better drag ratings than the closed faced spinning reels. Mm -hmm. uh, but Shakespeare makes a $15 uh, small combo. I've actually got one in the garage. I should have brought it in here to show you. It's probably, I don't know, three foot, three and a half foot long. Uh, it's a light rod. And you can catch all kinds of stuff on it. And then you got the Zebco Doc Demon. The Zebco Doc Demon is the exact competitor to that rod. I have personally seen an 8.2 pound bass be caught on a Zebco Doc Demon. 
they they are indestructible. They, they if you want a no joke rod that's going to last your kids forever, you can throw that in the back of your truck out of anger, pick it back up and catch fish out of pleasure. That that rod is not going to put you down. That, those are great for your kids, and they're great they're great uh, truck rods, honestly, because you can fit them behind your seat, you can fit them under your seat, put them in a the floorboard. It doesn't take up a lot of room. Um, all right, so. That kind of so now we're going to go ahead and we're going to get into bait casting gear and this is this is where I had my bread and butter for a long time was with casting gear. Now once again we're going to be between the seventy to hundred dollar range and I'm going to recommend a couple that are over that uh, with good reason as well. And uh, bef right before we go to that last thing on spin gear, if you're looking for a no joke, um, really solid combo under two hundred dollars, okay. It's, uh, it's the Daiwa Legalis and the Shimano X-Age in medium heavy. Those two are absolutely outstanding. Uh, I'd get a 2,500 in the Legalis, or you can even get a Shimano uh, Stellus rod, which is like 30 bucks. And then that combo would run you about 100 bucks. Shimano Stellus, uh, they're this beautiful baby blue rod that you can't mistake. And then the Legalis is uh, actually, I think they're cheaper now. I think they used to be 70 bucks, but I think they're about 35, 40 bucks now. So you could actually get that. I would, I would honestly recommend that combo probably over the Cadence CC5 and be right there with the Casking combo. Casking makes a good product. Uh, a lot of people, they kind of talk on Casking because the, they, a lot of people got sponsors from them uh, or Casking sponsors a whole bunch of people and people kind of talk down on it a little bit i don't know why but they, they talk down on that company but that company makes a good product all right so uh, it's affordable product it's a good product so um check out their website i'm not sponsored by them or nothing by that but they've got a lot of really affordable things on their website so uh, all these companies just just go check them out all right so casting gear uh touched on it before but i guess like gx2 and the casting form of it is, is that $60, um, it's that $60 setup, right? So it's not 70. I was mistaken. I misspoke before it. It's $60. That is hard to beat. Yeah. A, a seven, a seven foot medium heavy rod with a comparable reel to the Abu Garcia black max. It, it's literally maybe $10 cheaper than the black max combo. And it's right up there with it. Okay. Uh, it's, it's a, it's got six, uh, the rods come in six foot, six inches, not seven foot, by the way. I think that's the only difference between that and the black max combo. The black max combos go all the way up to, I believe seven, four on the rod length. Um, personally, if you're starting now, I wouldn't go over a seven foot or a seven, two, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the longer the rod, the further the cast, the more accurate the cast. There are a little, lot of good factors to that, but unless you want to be catching tree pounders all day, I'd recommend <laughs> going for that seven foot rod. Yeah. Uh, but but that the GX2 combo is a twenty pound drag on that reel. That that's a lot. That's a lot of drag. Um, you, you'll you'll snap line way faster than you'll lose a fish due to them pulling your drag out because literally you could wrench that down you could pull up a cinder block um, i'm not even joking you could literally do that um so anyway we'll move on to the next one and like i said i'm a daiwa fanboy. the daiwa laguna mm -hmm. uh, i'm not going in any specific order the daiwa laguna that rod by itself is i don't know what brian you fish them too they're what 40 oh, yeah. bucks right 45? Yeah, 40 yeah 40 bucks for the rod yeah there and that yes. thing i've i've hauled in a chinook on a twitching jig with it yeah, he, I'm. By the way, we're talking salmon. Yeah, we're we're talking freshwater behemoths. We're 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 not necessarily just freshwater, but we're talking big fish, like 15, 20 pound, all yeah. the way up to probably like 30, 35 pound fish. That'll fight you so hard, you think you're fighting a truck. Yeah. So and it handles it. And I fished a little Laguna for a long time myself. Uh, so what I'd recommend with the Laguna, this isn't your $70 to $100 range. This is a little bit more. This is going to fall into about $145. Is a Daiwa Laguna and a Shimano SLX. Yep. That's the my go-to. The Shimano SA, I, I fish that combo forever. Mm -hmm. The rod's sensitive enough to get it done. 
the reel is, I'm so impressed with that reel. It, mm. it is literally the working man's bait caster. It's, it's incredibly smooth. I don't know. I don't think it has the SVS infinity braking system. I don't know about that. I haven't looked at all that in a long time. So don't, don't quote me on that. Okay. But it's outstanding. You know, you put three brakes on, take three brakes off, you set your spool tension knob, cast out to the middle of the river. No problems. Mm -hmm. uh, you can even throw, you can even throw rooster tails on that, on that reel. And all that falls under about the $145 range. Now pick your rod accordingly to what you want to do. And the reels, uh, I had the 150 HGs in right hand retrieve. Outstanding. I think it's a seven, two to one. Yeah, uh, mine mine is uh, 151 HG, and uh, yeah. I have that in the left hand retrieve, um, and uh, that that one's at 8.2 to one. It it moves fast. So don't be afraid of high speed reels either, because uh, you can always slow down. Mm -hmm. uh, but really low gear ratio reels, they have a place. Don't think faster is better. The, those lower geared reels ha absolutely have a place. And I, we'll probably have a guest on here pretty soon that can really talk about that. Um, but you can always slow down. You don't always have to be burning baits. Okay. So just keep that in mind. Now, the last bait cast combo that I would recommend for the, the budget angler. Uh, and there are some other combos that you can get for cheaper. And once again, if, if that's all you can afford, get it. But honestly, if I, if I couldn't afford one of these casting combos, get a spinning combo and don't let anybody, no, seriously, don't let anybody say, oh, you don't fish bait casters? No, because this is comfortable and there's nothing wrong with fishing spinning gear. Now, people, people like to think that bait casters are a graduation from spinning gear. No, because I can skip baits better with a spinning gear than I ever could with casting gear no don't get me wrong i can skip baits i can skip jigs i can i can flip i can pitch i can do all that stuff because i fished it for a long time but i don't blow up and when i say blow up i don't mean like physically the reel explodes i mean the line on it okay if you don't hold the right pressure on your bait caster this spool's gonna bird's nest it's gonna over spool and then um you're gonna lose a bunch of line and it could be a really expensive line i don't have that problem with spinning gear uh, I huck out my bait and I, I bring it back in and they work the same way as bait casting gear. Okay. So don't let people just say, Oh, you fish spinning gear. You must be new. Oh no, that's not true. My dad's been fishing 40, 50 years it's longer than that. Probably 60 years, 60, 65 years, something like that. Mm -hmm. And he, yeah, he knows how to use bait casters. He can put, he can put me to shame with one. But he fishes spinning gear. So I'll get off that rant right there. But um, if I had to get one or the other, get your spinning gear. It's easier to use. Um, it's going to cost you less in the long run. Um, but for this last combo, for your bait casting combos or your casting combos, is Abu Garcia Black Max X3. That's just the Gen 3. They've been upgrading that reel since 2017 when it came out. 2018 maybe when it came out it's been around it, it's time tested and it's true and it's on every list that you can find pretty much for beginner's gear all right it's got good drag it's a good rod i'd say the rod's a little bit stiffer than it actually says it is okay um I, i've had a lot of medium heavy I, I fish primarily medium heavy because you know that's really good for texas rigs and uh all kinds of stuff right it's it's your general purpose rod if if you had to you can even throw frogs um not big ones but you can throw frogs now uh the black max rod is stiffer i'd say it leans more towards the heavy end because it comes in medium heavy i'd say it leans more towards your heavy and less towards medium heavy it, it's it, if it were broken down into fourths and medium heavy is your 50 well your three quarters is that black max rod it's not quite heavy it's not quite medium heavy it's right in the middle but it's a really good beginning budget setup all right um 
that's pretty much all I got for casting gear. Brian, what, what about you, man? You got anything to ch chime in on that? So, yeah. So on, on the casting gear thing, uh, just to, to echo John's sentiment, you know, um, casting gear, it, it's not like a, a, a graduation from spin gear because when I hit the river, I, I take one spin rod, I take one casting rod typically, or I might take two spin rods and a casting rod, depending on what I'm doing and the way that I like to fish. Okay. It's just, uh, what am I attempt? What, what am I trying to achieve? And so, you know, the, the casting rods are a lot of fun. Number one, once you get down how to cast with the reel and everything else, they're just so much fun to fish with. Not to say that spin rods aren't fun to fish with either, because I have spin rods on lighter, um, you know, ultra light actions and things like that, where they, they fish specific, uh, lures or baits a different way. And then I have the bait casters on, uh, that, that fish lures and rigs a different way, even from that. Now I could use one rod and one reel setup, but because I have ways that I like the way things work and feel personally, I'm, I'm always switching off back and forth. So you'll see me on the river. I'll, I'll have one or two spin rods or one or two bait rods and a spin rod. It just depends on what I'm fishing for that day. When I go out and I go for uh, bass, uh, I always take a spin rod with me because uh, some of the baits are a little bit lighter. And so they're not going to cast as well on my bait casting bass setup. Uh, or if I'm out steelhead fishing, uh, for example, I'll take a bait casting rod for my float rod because I'm not doing as much casting, but I like to let the, the line out really slow. I just like to kind of walk it through a run and really slow down the bait and control the tempo of the bait. And then I'll throw like a spoon or a spinner on my spin cast rod, or I'll drift fish with that spin cast rod. You could still do it with a bait caster, but just by my preference, that's what I like. Um, the rod action thing is that that really comes down to, um, you know, the style of fishing that you're doing and everything else. And, uh, you know, if, if you need to have intricate feel that medium fast action, uh, where you have enough power to haul the fish in, but you have that real light feel that's, that's going to make a big difference. Uh, if you run in a medium heavy action, you're still going to feel everything, but just not as fun, uh, you know, in, at that finite level. Uh, but, but you can, you can definitely use any one of those in any combination. It's just going to have a little bit different feel to it. That's, that's the, I, I guess if I could put it in my own words, it, it's just going to feel a little bit different. You're going to feel the lure vibrate different. You could take, uh, let's, let's say a rooster tail and you put it on a me medium heavy action rod, and then you put it on a medium fast uh, rod, and then you put it on, you know, just a medium rod, you're going to feel the blade vibration differently, or even like on an ultralight, you really feel it on that. So it's all in feel. What do you want to feel? What do you want to see? You know, and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and yeah, don't be afraid of a fast retrieve reel because you can slow down. It's actually good to be able to slow down, but also have the ability to haul that bait in really fast. So sometimes going with that faster gear ratio works really good, especially top water baits like whopper ploppers or something like that. You know, you want to get that, you know, you can get a really fast plop, especially if you get a, you know, a bass, it's real juiced up and you're going to fly out of the weed bed and hammer a top water, you know, so, so, but you can slow that down speed it up you can't necessarily speed up any faster with something with a lower gear ratio so it's all good stuff and all these combos are awesome i'm i am a diowa fan myself too and i love shimano once again but um there's there's all kinds of different stuff out there you don't have to just stick to those things but um it, the the combos once again these are just all super affordable oh man like uh you know the get on that a little bit uh, the Lewis Speed Spool, it's just as good as the Shimano SLX. It's like typically three to four dollars more, and it's just as good. Don't it? It is literally just as good. And you got to think, if if you had to spend more on one piece, do it on your rod. Okay, don't don't do it on your reel. Your reel is just holding your line. Your reel now drags important, lines important. And, you know, gear ratio is important to an extent once you get a little bit more in-depth of fishing. But if you had to spend more on something, do it on your rod because feeling the bait is more important than bringing it in. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So this is, uh, we're, we're moving in our fly combos now. Okay. Now you got to take all this with a grain of salt. There's going to be a lot of people that don't like hearing this. And what, what I want to say is, you know, our, our, Brian talked about this point 
early on as one of our bullets for this podcast. It's, it's quality versus quantity. Well, I could have 15 combos. Maybe they all have their own purpose. I'm not saying having 15 combos is bad. You know, first part of, you know, knowing you have a problem is finding out how to get more storage for your fishing rods, right? So 15 rods, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but what I am saying is I'd rather have two higher quality rods and reels than 15 lower end rods and reels. If you can take the time and save, if you don't need it right now, you can take the time and save. There's a couple of really good things about that. One, it gives you more time to think about it. Do I need this or do I want this? Two, gives you more time to really let it soak in that, do your homework. Is this really what I want? Is this really what I want to spend my money on? So if you got to save for it also, you're probably going to take better care of it. Uh, that, that's just how it goes. You know, uh, you get your. Uh, yeah. Uh, mailbox, no problem. Uh, shooting fireworks out of the sunroof, no problem. But as you get older and you spend more on something, let's say you, you buy your next vehicle, let's say it's $6,000. Well, I'm going to take a lot better care of that because that was a lot more money. It, it's it's kind of the, it's the same principles there. If you take care of even your lower end stuff, when I say lower end, I don't mean actually lower end. I just mean lower end on your price range. If you take care of that, it's going to last you a long time too. You know, if you treat everything like it's that $500 combo, it's going to last a long time. But your mid range rods and reels on all of these are going to last a lot longer typically than your other rods and reels. So, but we are going to get into the fly. The, the fly uh, combos now. Now, I'm going to go ahead and start out and say, I don't own a fly combo that's over $70. I don't. I've caught um, three and a half foot alligator, not alligator, but long nose gar. I've caught trout. I've caught largemouth bass. I've caught crappie. I've caught bluegill. I've caught catfish. You name it, I've caught it on these rods. But if I could go back, I probably would have saved up a little bit more. I'm going to tell you these work and there's nothing wrong with them. But the first thing I want to tell you is the, your fly line on your fly rod is what's really going to make the difference. You can take a $10 rod with a $10 reel and put $50 fly line on it. And it's going to cast like a hundred dollar combo would for your other sets. All right. It's going to be outstanding. So keep in mind, yeah, you can fish $10 fly line. I did it for a long time. It wears out quick. And you spend another $10 and then it wears out quick and you spend another $10. And then if you just would have saved that $50 for that first set of decent fly line, well, that stuff lasts a year, two years, three years, depends on how much you fish. And that's more budget friendly in the long run. So, but now we'll get into the rods and reels. So th this is a new rod and reel combo 2021 just came out. I was reading a lot about it because I was really curious about it. The Fly uh, Wild Water Starter Kit is $100, okay? It's a five, six weight rod. Uh, it's the two bearing reel, uh, ambidextrous retrieve, meaning you can change the drag star in it. Um, we, actually, we can show you guys how to do that. There's not a whole bunch of videos on how to do that online. And heck, we can show you how to do that ourselves. But anyway, it's ambidextrous. All you do is you, you flip the little star in your drag, and then it's, it goes from either right or left hand retrieve. It comes with nine flies, a fly box, and a rod case. $100. So if I spent $100 on that, and then I spent $50 online, well, I've got a fly box, I've got my rod case, I've got a rod, I've got a reel, and I've got good fly line. So that would bring your total up to around probably 160 after shipping. And it comes with taper, a tapered leader for that line as well. And the line that comes on it is weight forward floating uh, five weight. All right. So you could fish it at the hundred dollars and you got it, literally everything you need to get out on the water and go fish. No excuses. Everything's there. Okay. And then our next hundred dollar combo is your Cabela's big horn. Okay. It's also, like I said, it's a hundred dollars. So you don't get all the flies and all the other stuff. But um, it's been around a little bit longer. 
Uh, it's got a lot of good reviews on it. Um, I don't know all the specs or everything for this one, but their reviews are good. Uh, they're not overwhelmingly positive, but you've got a lot of people that think that uh, cheap isn't good. Okay. And that's not necessarily the truth, but um, it's got pretty good ratings. I think it was sitting at like a 4.1. Uh, it's not bad. I, it's not the your five-star review, but it sure as heck ain't your one and a half star review either. Okay. So th this, this was a little bit more personal to me. Okay. So this is a Piscifun sword and an angular dream reel. All right. These are both from Amazon. So you can get both of these in combination. The Piscifun sword is a $45 rod. Uh, they come in six weight and up. You don't get anything lower than six weight in these rods. Okay. I own a six weight myself. I've been fishing that six weight for eight months. Uh, no issues. I haven't broken an eye off. Um, my real seat hasn't slipped out. My handle hasn't spun off. Anything like that. Uh, and the Angler Dream reels, when you're fly fishing, your reel, for the most part, unless you get in a big fish, is just for holding line. And it's literally just for holding line because most of the time you're you're stripping and holding your line and bringing the fish in anyway uh that combo with ten dollar fly line if you were to get it would be ninety dollars okay uh, you still need fly line backing and some other things but that you can make that really affordable as well but that's an outstanding combo for eighty dollars uh, i fished it for a really really long time i still use that uh rod but i have upgraded to a vintage reel that i use on there now um, and, and th this is the one might tickle your pickle a little bit. I, I know we talk about how Orvis has like this, uh, how do I say this? A lot of people that use it have a bad reputation, uh, mainly for just being rude and all this other stuff, but there's a lot of good people that use Orvis also and there's a lot of good people at the Orvis shops okay I know we kind of we kind of smack talk to some of these brands every once in a while poke a little jab here and there but they make a good product no it's not all American made but I want to let you know for $350 now that's a lot of money that's a lot of saving okay that is uh that's 60 cents for like four months four or five months okay but that's a day 60 cents a day you can do that that's cheaper than a cup of coffee. The clear water rod comes with a 25 year warranty, 25. Let that soak in. Do you think you'll be fishing for 25 years? Well, that rod, as long as you have that serial number, which is above the reel, or not the reel, but the handle right above the handle or right below the handle above the reel seat, one of those two spots, as long as you have that serial number right there on your rod, it's covered for 25 years. Buy it, throw it in a wood chipper. It's covered. 25 years. Now, don't actually throw it in a wood chipper. I'm just saying it's covered. So $350 for peace of mind in a really, really good beginner's rod. It's got and, and it's a great reel. They're going to load it up with good fly line, all your backing. That comes with everything for $350. But that 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 25-year warranty is what gets my goat. You can't beat that. Because if I bought any of these other combos and let's say they last me a year or they last me five years, well, five years and I buy it five times, it's $400. When that Orvis is still cheaper than that and covered, for that same amount of time. So just that that's something for consideration. Not, not a lot of other companies offer outstanding warranties like that. I think the, uh, the Wade rod company has a really good warranty. Um, most, most of your fly, not most, but some of your fly rod companies, they have really good warranties, not all of them. Okay. And you're not going to get a warranty on your Amazon rods. You're not going to get a warranty on your Cabela's rods. You're not going to get on that wild water starter kit. You're not going to get warranties. Okay. Uh, the Wade Rod Company, uh, they offer a pay-as-you-go program. Um, say you wanted a, like a, let's just say $200, right? You wanted a $200 rod. Well, uh, they, they let you pay it off over a six-month period. They will mail it to you. You 
you start the program, they will mail you that rod so you can fish now and you pay it off over the next six months. It's also something to take into consideration and they have great warranties. So um, that's kind of where we're at on fly, uh, your fly gear itself. And uh, Brian, Brian fishes uh, other fly, fly gear himself. So I'm going to go ahead and pitch it on over to him and let him talk some. Yeah. So, um, you know, John just outlined three or four really good combos and, um, to get out there and fly fish, you don't have to spend a ton of money. Um, just to kind of highlight a couple other combos that I'm, I'm familiar with, uh, Maxon Outfitters. Uh, I, I consider Maxon to be a pretty darn good company. And I, I have one of their rods. It's, it's my, my, uh, pool cue. It's a, it's a nine to 10 weight rod. It's a, it's really heavy. I got it originally for salmon and steelhead. Uh, you know, some guys will say that that's an overkill on the weight, but it is a single hander rod. Not only that, but I also intend on using it, uh, for tiger muskie as well, which is a pretty toothy, big fish. It's, it's right up there with the long nose gar as far as, uh, uh, the power and size of that. And, and also throwing that heavy stuff, that full combo for that heavy game rod, uh, with the line and everything else, it, it came in right around the $200 mark, just to give you an idea. It has a cast reel. It's not a saltwater reel, so it's not seal bearing, uh, but it, but it can handle, uh, quite a bit of backing and some really heavy, uh, 10 weight line, which is what I have on it. Uh, it, it casts really good, uh, with a heavy fly on, you're not going to go out and dry fly fish with this rod. Uh, it's meant for streamers and, and, uh, leech patterns and, and all those types of things, uh, you know, really heavy weighted, um, uh, you know, sinking flies and uh, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but, but Maxon has some fantastic outfits in the hundred to two hundred dollar price range with the real. Uh, they, they have combos that are right around the 179 mark. But, you know, there again, that can be cost prohibitive for a lot of folks. In uh, Cortland, they have some great combos out there too that you can go down to the local oh, yeah. tackle shop and they have uh, rod and reel combos that are loaded with line and they already have a piece of seven and a half foot 5X tippet, which is uh, when, when we talk about 0X, 1X, 2X, that, that's how fine the, the end of the taper is on, on that, that leader. Uh, but they'll, they'll have like a 5X uh, tapered leader tied on the end of it. And you go down there and get it for 99 bucks buy it by a handful of flies out of the, the little fly area, or even, you know, like a combo box and you can be out fly fishing that afternoon, you know, learning how to cast and do things like that. So, uh, Cortland has some great stuff. I, uh, scientific angler has some great combos out there too. Uh, Okuma, uh, which is more of a brand that's local to us uh, up here in the Pacific Northwest. They have some great two piece fly rods as well, uh, that, that are great for beginners. Uh, you can get a rod for about 40 bucks and you get one of the reels for 60. So you, there again, you're at a hundred. 120 bucks they're not they're they're not the the gold medal top of the line but i'll tell you i've caught a lot of trout and a lot of panfish on my okuma i've caught a lot of those on on my um my little uh, berkeley cherry wood i have one of those it's just a little seven and a half foot uh four weight rod uh i i use that for real small stream fishing it has a fenwick reel on it uh a lot of times you can just get a fly rod given to you by somebody who's like eh, i can't figure out how to cast it and you're like oh i'll take that uh eagle claw <laughs> <laughs> you know eagle claw makes a good combo the the reels aren't that great i'll tell you that but just to start out to get yourself out there tossing a fly uh eagle claw makes another great combo that's right in about the 40 to 50 dollar mark they started out like 1999 back in the in the late 80s there are eight weight rods so they're heavy uh they're they're a little bit more forgiving on on the casting because they are a heavier line uh you can you can throw them further so there's a there's a lot of great combos i don't have all the technical specs because i'm letting john really take that one on but there's, there's so many great uh, beginner fly outfits out there where if you're, you're not sure if you're going to really be into it and you don't want to have a massive investment of money into it, you can go anywhere from that, that $40 mark all the way up to, you know, like the Orvis Clearwater. Let's say you get one of those and you're like, man, I really love fly fishing. You smack your first fish on a, on a dry fly 
and you're just hooked and you want to, you know, keep going, then yeah, you can step up to that. These are, these are all great. Or even the, the Piscifun uh, sword, that's a, that's a probably one of the best rods out there, honestly. And you couple it up with a good reel, uh, you're going to be able to go out there and have a great time with anything from panfish to bass to trout to alligator gar or long nose gar. You know, you, you can catch anything on one of those rods as long as it's appropriately weighted. So I, I think these are, once again, John, a great selection here of, of really good solid rods. I just, you know, uh, the only thing I can add to it is, is just, you know, maybe, maybe some rods that are more regionally specific to, to different areas, but, uh, outside of that, these are available to everybody. And, uh, back available to everybody. That's important. Uh, I live in Texas. There's two fly shops in Texas. I'm not a fly shop. I'm just a fly tire. Okay. Uh, there's two fly shops in Texas. I'm not going to shout them out. Look them up. All right. Um, to my knowledge, they're good folks. They carry a lot of stuff. They'll help you out. Um, but if you absolutely want to go somewhere, get a fly rod, pick it up today, and you live in Texas, go to Academy Sports. Okay? The reel is absolutely terrible. It's the worst reel I've ever had in my life. It's all plastic. It's left-hand retrieve, and I'm right-handed it's just it's miserable that that reel is absolutely terrible uh but your reel just holds line okay the combo is 45 dollars. it comes with five flies it comes with a leader it comes with fly line it comes with fly line backing and it comes with a five five slash six weight rod which generally any rod that says one weight to another it leans toward that latter number of those two Companies need to stop doing that junk. If it's a five weight, it's a five weight. If it's a six weight, it's a six weight. Okay. But it's a Fluger combo. It's $40, $45. It comes with everything you need to go fly fish. That was the first thing I bought when I started fly fishing. I wasn't going to recommend it. And then when he said regionally accessible, that's when I thought about it. I was like, that's why I started tying flies is because there, there are no fly shops within six hours of me. I'd have to drive six dang hours to go buy flies or buy a rod and reel setup. But Academy didn't have flies, but they did have that rod and reel combo for $40. And that's how I'm here today. So uh, that is another good one to add in there. Yeah. And, and just to All let right. you know, uh, on, on the same subject of like fly shops and availability for John, his it's a necessary evil for him to tie flies and things like that uh here in, in the portland metro area i can think just as far as specific fly shops go i think we have five or six just in the portland metro area on top of all of the major retailers and and kind of the middle of the road retailers actually being a part of uh, of that whole fly culture too so you can you can roll into like uh you know some of you might know him as a kroger we know him as a fred meyer you can go into a fred meyer buy a fly combo you can go into dick's sporting goods and and have your pick of like four or five fly combos or, or um like a sportsman's warehouse or a cabela's here there's a lot of those we actually have orvis stores here as well so you can go into the orvis store and pick up a clear water combo directly from the orvis store uh, that that's just what it is uh so regionally, yeah, if you're living in a region where fly fishing isn't popular, you're probably not going to find uh, a lot of places to access that. But like John said, Academy Sports, they're going to have a fly combo. You can get started with that. It gets you on the river today and it's reasonably priced. And if you don't like it, you're not out of hundreds of dollars. Yeah, that's a fact. And let me tell you, if you absolutely hate fly fishing, good on you. That fly rod you get for that forty dollar combo, you can put a spinning reel on, and now you mm -hmm. have an ultralight. You have an ultralight eight and a half foot spinning rod that is like it's like a it's like a noodle. It's like a spaghetti noodle. Yeah. Wait until you hook. Wait until you hook a bass on that, throwing a crappie jig with your fifteen hundred reel put on that rod. It's fun. You can do it. All right. Oh, yeah. All right. So. We, we've, we've talked about a few of spinning, casting, and fly combos, okay? There's lots of other great companies out there. Um, we didn't want to take uh, an exuberant amount of time telling you about all these combos. Uh, 
go do some research for yourself. It only makes you better at figuring out what you want. All right. Our word is not law. All right. These are recommendations. These are opinions. I gave you some numbers on some things, but what I can tell you is that I would fish any of these. Okay. So now we're moving into terminal tackle. Uh, what is terminal tackle? Well, terminal tackle are your hooks, uh, your sinkers, your beads, um, those type of things that you need. You don't necessarily need all of them, but you're going to need some of them anyway to really get started. Okay. Uh, even if you're throwing a bobber and a worm, no, you don't need a sinker, but I would classify a bobber or a cork or a strike indicator, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I'd classify that in your terminal tackle because if, if you're brand new to it, uh, fishing a bobber is probably going to be the most enjoyable way to eat for you to catch your first fish. It's very visual. Uh, it allows you to get a grasp of slack line versus tight line. And it's, you know, people do it everywhere. It, it's, it produces almost every time. Okay. So I would say, they make small, smaller, thin, kind of like pen bobbers, okay, is what I'd call them. Uh, they're made out of cork. All right, they're very thin. They taper down to uh, a thin cylinder and then taper back down to your finite points, right? So points, cylinder, taper. Get them. You can get them uh, at Walmart. I think some of them are 79 cents. Some of them are $1.49. There's a plethora of them. They sell a lot of them, okay? Uh, hooks. You need to figure out what you're fishing for. If it's just for a fish, get a size 10 or a size 8 hook. Get bait holder hooks. Get you some night crawlers. Get you some red worms. Get you some wax worms. Get you some mill worms. Notice we're saying worms because everything eats worms. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, um, a size, I'd say 12 to 8 bait holder is going to do you a lot of good. You can catch a bunch of stuff on this. It's small enough for panfish. It's big enough for bass. Okay. Um, if you know you're targeting panfish specifically, go ahead and get a size 10. If you know you're just targeting bass, we're going to get on, in on that in just a second. But if you that all around, like your medium heavy, uh, go from size 12 to size 8. Brian, would, would you agree that that's a reasonable hook size? Oh yeah. Yeah. I think, I think if I could select two hooks to put in my arsenal, it would be a size eight and a size 12 because you can catch, you can, you know, regionally here, you can catch trout, you can catch crappie, you can catch bluegill, pike minnow, uh, you know, even, even a steelhead on a size eight, if it, if it was really pressing, you're getting, you know, we'll, we'll talk more about uh, larger game species, but probably a size eight and a size 12. If I had two hook sizes to select, if I was going down to the tackle shop and I, and, and I was like, okay, I'm going to go fish for trout. I'm going to get a size eight and a size 12 bait holder done. Nothing else. Awesome. So now we'll, so we'll, we'll go ahead and put crappie into that same thing. Uh, crappie, same size hooks. Um, there's crappie jigs. <coughs> Excuse me. Need to go grab some water. I but, can, uh, if, if you want me to uh, talk a little bit about uh, different types of uh, hook setups and you go grab some water, I can uh, keep that going. Yeah. I'll okay. be right back. All right, cool. Let me use this. So as far as uh, hooks go, so John John's talking about um, those different types of hooks. So when we talk about bait holders, typically they're snelled. So a snelled bait holder is going to have a, a pre-tied line that's tied around the shank of the hook, and it has a loop on the end so that it can be connected to either your main line or to another piece of leader that's connected off of it. Now, you can go buy the hooks in their own right. You get a little box of hooks and you can, you know, buy some size eights and some size 12s in those hooks. 
or, or size tens, whatever size that that's determined. But then there's also other kinds of hooks that you can get. So um, outside of bait holders, there's also uh, specific types of hooks like circle hooks that work really well for uh, fishing for catfish with larger, heavier baits. Um, there's hooks that are pre-tied with uh, what we call an egg loop for actually affixing bait to. Uh, and, and we use egg loop hooks here in the Pacific Northwest for uh, salmon and steelhead fishing, but also um, anything with that type of tie off. Uh, we, we may also use that for sturgeon fishing uh, because uh, in regards to like the sturgeon fishing, we would use a, a pre-tied hook or we tie our own with uh, what we call Dacron. Uh, and so uh, those types of hooks are already pre-tied and they're barbless. So Real quick on on the hooks, I was just explaining John about the um, about the uh, snell bait holders versus the individual hooks that you can buy in the box that you tie on yourself versus um, pre tied leaders with like egg loops on them and stuff like that, and then also the different types of hooks that are out there like a circle hook or an octopus hook or a big river bait holder. You know, the basically yeah. a snell hook is going to get you by. Uh, a bait holding snelled hook is going to get you by for the majority of everything. But I was just explaining a little bit more in depth on some of those different types of hooks. And then you have the EWG hooks for holding soft plastics and things like that. Each, each hook, you'll go into the tackle shop and you'll go cross-eyed because you see this whole plethora of hooks and they all have their own thing that they, that they all serve a purpose of. But what we're talking about, they come in a little rectangular package uh, and, and you can just cut the bottom Eagle of them. Claw. Yeah. Eagle claw. Eagle Claw, Danielson, South Bend, um, Gamakatsu, uh, who else? Owner makes a, a snow Owner. hook. Yeah, uh, there's there's a whole bunch of different manufacturers. You should be able to roll into any store like Walmart or whatever else. I uh, probably uh, I, I I'm not sure what uh, Walmart's carrying as far as a snelled now. If it's a South the, Bend or an Eagle so Claw, it's a it's an Eagle Claw razor sharp. Okay, yeah. Or uh, they got they got. I'm sorry. Oh no, they, Eagle Claw has caught millions of fish. Yeah. Yeah, they've got um they got Snells and then they've got Aberdeen's Eagle Claw primarily does. Mm -hmm. Um and you get 10 for you can get 20 without leaders tied for about 250. Okay, I actually tie a lot of streamers on their size two uh not snails, but their size two Aberdeens. Uh, they're, they're good hooks. They're thin wire. They have great, uh, great penetration. But anyway, we're, we're not talking about streamers and stuff. I'm just saying Eagle Claw is cheaper, mm -hmm. but it's a really good brand. Don't, don't be afraid to pick up an Eagle Claw hook. Right. And depending on the type of bait that you're fishing, you know, and, and we'll go over baits in a little bit, but uh, you also have a uh, really small what they call like an egg hook for running a single salmon egg. Okay. So it's going to be dinky, dinky, dinky. And when we're talking about size eight to 12, you can still run salmon eggs on those bait holders. Let's say if you're going to fish that type of thing, or even, um, uh, crappie nuggets or little crop, you know, trout magnets, crappie magnets, whatever else you can still fish those on there. Um, and, and then they also make a treble hook for dough type baits. So if you're, if you have to form a dough ball around the bait, you'll, you'll see and a treble hook, treble try is going to have three individual points, which you'll see more treble hooks on, um, you know, crank baits and jerk baits and, and those types of baits out there. Um, you know, here in the Pacific Northwest, we're going to see them on inline spinners, buzz bombs, uh, those types of, um, uh, you know, that type of tackle, but in the South, you're going to see it a lot on crank baits, jerk baits, uh, rattle traps, all those different types of baits, the, the treble hook, and uh, they, they have a specific use. So what we're talking about is a basic single point barbed or barbless hook. And we can talk about barb versus barbless a little bit, but um, you know, that that's, that's your basics. It hooks, hooks go into a whole mess, just like uh, sinkers do too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Um spoke about snails snails like brian said to get you done um we briefly mentioned ewgs um so we'll get in a little bit bigger game now i think we covered the panfish bit and you know bait holders uh egg leap hooks um egg hooks um and they even make trout hooks. There's even specifically a hook called a trout hook, and they're super tiny. 
And when he says dough, he doesn't just mean uh, like bread. Uh, power bait is a dough bait. There's a lot of different dough baits that you can smash onto a hook and it catches a lot of fish. Um, so, but EWG hooks means extra wide gap. Okay. Uh, I really should have just went and grabbed my tackle box to show you guys this stuff. It's literally right over there, but your extra well, wide gap hook. Go ahead. Yeah, we'll we'll do a future tutorial on uh, hook styles uh, on on the YouTube. So uh, I'll I'll get okay. that out and we'll and we'll do that. So your extra wide gap it just it has a large bend in it, and the eye is set with the barb and point of your hook, but the rest of your hook is going to loop down here, and then barb and eye, well, and well, point and eye is what I should say are in line so it gives you a lot of gap to get it in the fish's mouth typically these are used for soft plastics um texas rigs i mean really you're going to texas rig just about everything you put on an extra wide gap hook and and when i say texas rig that's just the rigging style which will also go over more than likely on youtube um they're really really great for bass uh, bass and just bigger game in general. I say bass because that's what's around here for me. Brian probably has another species that he could say, well, extra wide gaps are great for this, but bass in particular are fantastic. Uh, we'll go back and say eagle claw laser sharp. Okay. They're not super cheap. They're not super expensive. I think if you get 10, maybe it, it's, it's either 10 or eight in a pack. It's like three or $4. Get three aught, three slash O. Okay. Um, so we, we talked about hook sizes all the way up to, you know, like a 10, right? Well, at some point you're going to get into a size one. Okay. So a size one is not a one on. Okay. A size and then a hook is smaller than EWGs. EWGs and trailer hooks and other hooks like that come in aughts, which are big. Those are big hooks, okay? Three aught is a fantastic size. Three aught will fit most three to 3.25 inch baits and anything bigger than that, not smaller than that. Um, three inches is about as short as you can go on a three aught, and then you're barely skirting by at that three inches, but three odd is great because it's not so big to where the smaller if you hook a smaller fish and you get a good hook set straight up here if you're, if you're doing a texas rig and you get it and you get that perfect hook set and it's here well a three odd's not going to get in its brains okay a five odd and a small fish you'll you you have a much higher chance of accidental death of that fish by using that bigger hook and um morally i'll leave that up to you i recommend a three out i don't care what you use but i recommend a three out okay um straight shake hooks straight shake hooks are more of your trailing style hooks for spinner baits buzz baits um, a lot of moving baits like that okay um, they typically come with a um a rubber or silicone covering over the eye i actually have some of these right here These are size 2O, which means 2 aught. okay? These are straight shank trailing hooks. They're like really big Aberdeens, okay? You see that? Mm -hmm. typically, they'll, typically, they'll come with a covering over the eye, and what happens is you have your spinner bait, and sometimes fish short strike, right? And what this is is uh, it's quality assurance. In, in the aspect of, I know that adding this to my bait, it's going to work. I mean, that's what I mean by QA. I, I'm not saying like, uh, like you're doing maintenance or something, but uh, it's quality assurance and it's insurance to where you know that this very well could catch the fish. And what you would do is, this is the back end of your spinner bait. It would slide on to that other hook. So now you have two hooks. Some places don't allow you to fish two hooks, okay? Uh, you have to read into your local regulations, but that, that's where your straight shank hooks would be and kind of in that realm. And some people use them for 
These are for fly time. So you got you got all kinds of stuff, but you know, uh, we talked hooks for a long time. Oh yeah. Um, sinkers. So uh, sinkers or your split shot or your lead or whatever. <clears throat> they make small circular containers, plastic containers um, with split shot, or some people call, just call them lead. Split shot can get you by with pretty much everything. Okay. Um, they make green containers. I'm not saying go look just for green, but those are stainless steel rather than lead. Okay. Uh, some fishery. Um, so, but you can use stainless steel uh, in, in replacement of that. Okay. And there's also some that are like, uh, I think nickel. I think you can also get some nickel um, weights. Anyway, uh, those are great for underneath bobbers. You can use those to make pseudo drop shots. You can peg those right on top of your hook and use them as bullet weights for your Texas rigs. They're all around. They're fantastic to have, even in the fly world. If you need to get a nymph deeper, faster, or just deeper, period, split shot. Cast kind of wonky, does the job. <clears throat> bullet weights if you're targeting big game on the bottom and by on the bottom i'm talking about texas rigs specifically carolina rigs things like that um you use egg sinkers for carolina rigs but uh anyway you can use bullet weights too bullet weights are fantastic um it's shaped like a bullet head all right uh fat end towards the bait thin end towards your rod tip okay what that allows the bait to do is it'll stay to the bait sometimes out here, but what it does is it adds that weight close to the bait. So it's easier to cast and split shot crimps line. So after a while, your line will become weak and you'll break your line. Uh, bullet weight slide, or you can peg them, but um, the primary use is going to be for your, your underwater jigging plastics. <clears throat> so we talked about bobbers uh foam bobbers are great too okay you don't have to go out and buy your airlock bobbers for fly fishing okay yeah they are biodegradable and they're actually a lot more affordable than i thought they were i think it's like a five pack for like 15 bucks um biodegradable all that stuff but you don't need all that stuff everywhere okay um thin cork bobbers cheap float like a son of a gun easy to find if they snap off they're really easy to see okay um foam bobbers work great they're super light uh there's weighted bobbers as well those are for more like your bottom fishing cat fishing or you use weighted bobbers for bobber dogging right yeah so um our so just to kind of echo on what, what john's saying here so the bobbers that we use for uh, big game targeting uh, in, in, here in the Pacific Northwest, we have a couple different types. We have like a torpedo shaped float, which is really good for floating. Uh, what, what we would know is like a floating jig or something like that. Then we have one that has a flat bottom on it. And that one's used for a technique called bobber dogging. And bobber dogging is basically a way to uh, keep your bait kind of floating above the bottom, but work it through a hole extremely slow. And basically it has a, so you have your bobber, the bobber's got a flat bottom and you have your, your main line coming through with a, what we call a three-way swivel and a cannonball weight that comes down like this. And then you have your, your leader that extends 24 to 36 inches. And then you have your bait down here. And what it does is it basically, this is working as the bobber up here works as a little bit of an indicator and your stream flow directions going like this, your weights down here and it's ticking on the bottom. And as it's ticking on the bottom, it's trailing that bait up like this, just right into the area where if a fish is coming upstream, they can get into the bait and bang, they grab it. And that bobber goes down and you jerk back and fish on. That's so the, that that's kind of a weighted bobber. They're rated for different weights. It gets a little bit more technical. So you get a half ounce bobber, then the rest of your tackle below it needs to equate to a half ounce or less in order for it to work correctly. Now you can weight it heavier. It sinks deeper, but in order for it to work correctly, you're, you, let's say 
you're running a quarter ounce jig and a quarter ounce cannonball, then that half ounce bobber is going to support everything. A lot of people go to five eighths and they run a half ounce underneath of it and it rides a little higher in the water, easier to see. It's all personal preference on it. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> sorry, sorry. My cat's trying to take my leg off down here. Oh, okay. <clears throat> so, you know, we, we talked about all the things to put on your line, but Let's take a quick second and let's talk about line. Um, this this is something that could get way crazier than us talking about hooks, okay? But we're going to keep it very simple, okay? Monofilament is cheap and it'll get you by, mm -hmm. uh, especially if you're starting out. You can buy, I don't know, 25, 50 yards of Ozark Trail monofilament, which, by the way, I tie my leaders out of for fly fishing. Uh, well, I did until I, I bought some Rio leaders, <laughs> finally. but, um, but it works. I've caught big trout and I've caught bass on them. It's good line and it's a dollar 20 a spool from four pound all the way up to 12 pound. You can, you can buy two of those and spool a whole rod. No issues. Um, it floats monofilament floats. It's got a lot of stretch in it. Um, those are the main things you need to know about monofilament. It stretches and it floats. Okay. Uh, I personally think it's a little bit more brace, uh, abrasion resistant myself. Uh, that, that's a personal thing. It's, um, I can't prove that, but for, in my experience, I think it's pretty abrasion resistant. Um, you have braid. <clears throat> braid has no slack, uh, no slack, no give. Whatever's on the end of that. Hold on my dang cat. Ash, get down there. Whatever's on the end of that line, if you're fishing straight braid, it's getting a hook. Okay. Mm -hmm. Something's beeping. Do you hear that? Uh, no, I don't. Hmm. It was just me. No, I think we're, I think we're good. I just heard two beeps. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> Sorry. But, uh, dang, I lost my lost my train you're talking about braid yeah whatever is on the end of your braid is getting a hook that's that's the last thing i said uh, there's no stretch it sinks it's fantastic for topwater baits i mean absolutely fantastic for topwater baits because they're gonna hit and you've got literally split seconds to figure this out okay you've got to wait a second for them to get it in their mouth and then you got to commit to that hook set well if you've got braid that hook set it's going to be clean. doesn't matter if you're hundred foot out. doesn't matter if you're two foot out. It's going to pull tight as long as you're fishing it right. Mm -hmm. uh, braid two liter is fantastic, especially with our next setup. Uh, fluorocarbon. Fluorocarbon has less stretch than monofilament. It is crystal clear. I'm talking crystal clear. This is my cat, y'all. She won't leave me alone. And uh, it sinks. All right, uh, not like monofilament, it floats, fluorocarbon sinks. So if you're fishing baits that are really going to stay under, consider fluorocarbon. But if you're trying to be more budget friendly, consider fluorocarbon leaders tied with uh, either blood knots or uh, double uni can, knots. Yeah, right, double uni. A double, a double uni or blood. All right, those are the two knots that you really need to know for leaders. One of the great things about that is you can go buy a $10 spool of fluorocarbon and you don't have to worry about it having really bad memory. Cheap fluorocarbon is not good fluorocarbon. Okay, that I'm, I, I hate to say it because I know we're trying to cater to the, the working class here, but I'm letting you know, if you think you're gonna spend $15 and get good fluorocarbon, it, it's just not going to happen. Uh, I, ha I hate saying that, but it's because I did the same thing because I'm a working class, you know, fella just like y'all. I was like, $15, I can afford that. And then I got it and my spool kept blowing up and that $15 was gone in like 40 minutes. And so was my patience. Okay. Now, Seaguar Red Label is a little bit cheaper and it can kind of get you by. <clears throat> yeah, I think it is around the $15 range. And you can, you can spool one or two rods with backing with that, no problems. 
but anything cheaper than that, like your floor clear, your um, any of those, don't do a full spool of those on your reel. Just don't use it, use it as leaders. You'll have enough line for leaders the rest of your life if you buy one spool of it for 10 or 15 bucks. Yeah, and, and so preferably to me, all of my rods are spooled uh, with braid. And uh, I'm not going to say it's the cheapest way to go necessarily. However, pound for pound durability for the purposes that I typically fish, I prefer to have braid as my main line. Some people prefer fluorocarbon as their main line. Some people prefer monofilament as their main line. Growing up, caught a lot of fish on monofilament on on trilene basically that's what, that's what we would call it. it it's a penny per yard it's super cheap it works good it will develop a memory over time uh you know uh, but if you're fishing with it typically it's not going to develop too much of a memory and as as you catch more fish it stretches out everything else it it, it will lose that memory but if you're fishing a lot of bobber setups like we do here in the Pacific Northwest, uh, or, or you're, you're fishing some heavy baits and you want good clean hook setups, you're going to fish braid because braid will float. It will also sink fast. It cuts through the water. It has a very low water resistance. And the, the weight rating to diameter is another big one because you can get a lot of braid on your reel versus mono or fluoro because of the fact that braid is a lot stronger you can take a eight uh, a 30 pound test braid at an eight pound test diameter if, just as an example and you can get that eight mount allotment with 30 pound power so you can use a smaller sized reel and get more uh, uh, endurance during your day of fishing rather than needing to use a super big reel, especially if you're fishing a fishery where uh, it requires a lot of casting and retrieving for a large game species. Uh, that, that might be something that you take into consideration. That's probably one of the big advantages to braid as well is that you can get uh, quite a bit of line on a small reel with a lot of fighting power. That's one thing I will say about it. Uh, the, you know, the fluoro disappears. It's, it's my preferred leader. Uh, I usually just get the smallest little spools that I can. That way I can carry a variety of diameters. I carry 10, 12, 15, and 20 pound fluoro. That's what I carry for my leaders and my personal self. But some people go clear down to six pound or four pound uh, in, the, in my fly kit. That's what it is. It's, it's going to be a lot lighter, but uh, you can get the small, small spools for a fairly reasonable price. And you're not talking about needing to rip off, you know, 30, 40, 50 feet in certain cases. Sometimes it's just a small section, but you can, you know, if you want to have a long bumper on there, then yeah, you're going to be looking at 20, 30 feet. You're going to have to invest in that larger spool. Absolutely. And <clears throat> another thing about braid too, is if you're starting to learn how to cast a bait caster, braid is going to be an excellent tool for you to learn. Um, the, the, there's no line memory on braid. It's just braided line. Okay. There's no line memory. What I am going to say is uh, keep your spool tension knob tight. Don't, don't get too much in a hurry or you're going to have to literally cut all that braid down to the bottom of your spool to get it out. And if, if you're throwing 30 to 60 pound braid on there, because you got it for a good price, cutting 200 yards of 60 pound braid off of a spool ain't too fun. Yeah. But for the price and what it applies to you and how it casts, because it's very light and there's memory, it lets you build that those good habits with your thumb and you can't beat that so starting out to a leader okay because you don't want to tie uh braid into all of your stuff you you know some people say oh well you can you can put you can use a sharpie and you can color your braid black and it makes it harder to see it already comes in moss green man maxima green is one of the most popular colors of line there is especially in the fly world it already comes in moss green i don't think changing it to black is going to change a whole lot bud but i know for a fact adding a leader will so bait casters start off that and then spin cast i'd recommend mono honestly because it, it's affordable 
Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're going back to that Daiwa D shock for 30 bucks. You go get that. And then you go get you a spool of mono. I've got five spools of mono in my garage right now, 500 yards that I got for 350 a piece. I've got, you know, a little over $17 worth of line that's going to last me three years. And that's not even kidding. That's literally three years of line in there. So just, just, just keep that in mind when you're buying your line. And uh, Brian, thanks, thanks for sharing all that, bud. Yeah. Um, I think we're on plastics now. Yeah. Somewhere around there. Mm -hmm. so, so plastics, uh, what we kind of both agreed on this is <clears throat> there are no cheap plastics. If you want to be perfectly honest, um, there are cheap quality plastics but there are no reasonable plastics at a cheap price. Uh, Ozark Trail came out and a lot of people have kind of been shocked by those because they're kind of durable. They catch fish. They're a decent price. I'll give them that. Um, as a plastics manufacturer myself, uh, it kills me seeing people pay for big bait brands. So we're not going to talk brands. We're not going to talk price range. What we are going to talk about is colors. Okay get what you can afford but i'm going to recommend these colors because these colors catch fish clear water stained water blown out water it doesn't matter these colors produce and it's starting out with just green pumpkin green pumpkin green pumpkin red uh that color kills there's something about green pumpkin that sets fish off you can catch fish everywhere on green pumpkin you can catch fish everywhere on watermelon, watermelon red, watermelon red on a shaky head jig. I know we didn't get into jigs. We'll probably get into that some other time, but watermelon red worm right now on a shaky head jig. <clears throat> if your bass are finicky, they're going to bite that. They are going to bite that. Now, if, if you want to talk about uh, kind of more fun plastics in a color that you'd think might not catch fish, if you're new anyway, but uh, ain't no use if it ain't chartreuse, right? Chartreuse right. is a is a fish catching color, especially if you want to catch a lot of panfish or even some bass. Uh, get a chartreuse Mr. Twister or just a grub in general around two inches. Put it on a small jig headed hook. OK, and what that is, that's a 90 degree hook. It looks like this. This is where you tie on. This is your hook eye. Comes down, your jig's here. This is your hook itself. Uh, Brian actually made a really in affordably powder, powder dip and powder paint, powder coat paint your baits. Uh, not your baits, but your jigs. All right, we've got that on our YouTube. It's really excellent. And that can give you an idea of what a jig hook looks like. Uh, those catch fish like crazy okay chartreuse chartreuse is a great color <sighs> cats so <laughs> if you lose me i'll be right back so uh yeah just to, to echo that like uh the 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 green pumpkin uh watermelon chartreuse uh purple and you know all those colors just seem to produce a lot of fish and if you're if you're going out there to pick up your soft plastics you know just you, you can't go wrong with those colors they, they'll catch fish anywhere we catch them here uh, up in the northwest on those colors you catch them in the south on those colors it's just what turns them on it, you know and when he said purple an excellent purple color the very first soft plastic color ever this, this is just fun fact not as important was uh it was a dark grape all right it was a man's jelly worm Okay, that was the very first plastic ever. It was a dark gray color, which is just this deep purple, almost like the top of this spool here. Okay, uh, June bug is dark purple with green flake. It's another excellent color. It's really, really good when the water is kind of getting tingy. And then the color that you will catch fish everywhere, no matter water clarity, is black and blue. Black and blue is one of the most legendary, renowned colors period if you if i had to have one color jig or one color soft plastic it would be black and blue because i can fish that in any water clarity and i will 
people catch fish. So those are our colors that we're going to talk about. Um, you can find those anywhere. You can find those in any bait. So remember, buy within your range and don't overspend on your plastics. You don't need all these colors. You don't need all these baits. If you, if, so we talk colors, I'll give you three baits that are going to catch fish uh, style-wise. That is a crawl, a worm, and I would even venture to say a creature bait. Okay, so a crawl, a worm, and a creature bait will cover all three criteria for a fish to eat. All right. Uh, seriously, a, a stick bait will catch pretty much anything. And there's a million ways to rig it. And with stick bait, I mean a worm. Okay. They're usually about five inches. Uh, any of those colors that we or were aforementioned, they're going to catch fish. And that's about as far as we're going to go in on plastics because plastics is kind of a, it's, uh, there, there's a lot for mm -hmm. plastics. And I'm pulling my notes back up. Yeah. Sorry. So, so just to echo on a few more plastics out there, uh, obviously, um, you know, there's saltwater plastics, there's the freshwater plastics, like what, what John, and, and there's really no difference between what John was saying, you know, the, the, the crawfish patterns, the, the worm patterns, the creature bait patterns, uh, you know, grub patterns, anything like that. They're going to work universally. We use, um, we use plastic worms for steelhead. We also use uh, soft plastic beads that mimic salmon eggs drifting down river. Uh, we also use uh, uh, sandworm mimickers for surf perch and saltwater and uh, those types of plastic baits. So there's a whole plethora. Maybe we'll do another episode on nothing but saltwater and freshwater soft plastics. So, um, you know, maybe we'll do something like that. So John's done quite a bit of talking about the, uh, you know, the soft plastics and, and the terminal tackle and everything else. And I'm going to kind of uh, take over on this direction here and uh, talk to everybody a little bit about live bait. And uh, we, we use a lot of live bait uh, with a lot of the fish species that we fish here. And of course, there's live bait everywhere. Uh, and, and there's all types of different live bait that can be used. And, and a lot of people say, well, I, I, I stay away from live baits or um, synthetic baits or things like that, because that's not what they want to do. But honestly, one of the best ways for you to get on fish is to use different types of baits. And I think probably one of the biggest things is, is determining the right bait and the varieties of baits that are out there, because you can walk into a tackle shop and there's just stacks and stacks and stacks of, of these different baits. So start out with the most basic of basic, what, what's available in your yard. Let's just start there. So the one thing that I know universally is available for most people, uh, depending on the climate and region you live in, are going to be worms. These can be red worms, night crawlers, uh, you know, different types of uh, grubs or maggots or anything like that. Those types of baits that you can forage yourself oftentimes are, are the most productive for catching fish. The, the, uh, the standard night crawler, some of you might know it as a Canadian night crawler, we just know them as night crawlers. Uh, you can make this actually a really fun activity for the kids even. Turn your sprinkler on in the front yard and let it soak you know, all day if you have a nice grassy spot. At night, walk out there afterwards with a flashlight. You will see the worms coming up to the surface and you pick those worms up and you get a little cup and you can put some shredded up newspaper and a little bit of dirt and some cornmeal in there because they'll eat the cornmeal. You dump all that stuff in there and you just start plucking those worms off the ground and you throw them in there and uh, you, you got instant bait. You can get a dozen night crawlers, two, three, four. You don't even have to spend any money on it. You can take an old butter container, uh, like, like a margarine container or a sour cream container or a salsa container, whatever you got. And, and you can fill it up with dirt and you can go pick those up and you can get those. It's like one of the most traditional things that you can do. And that's one of the, the fun parts of fishing. And when I was growing up, that's what we did. Uh, or, you know, let's say you have a garden spot. You can go stick the shovel in the soil, turn it over. As long as you don't have chickens like mine that want to come up and eat the worms as soon as you turn it over. Uh, <laughs> what, what you can do is uh, you, can, you can go up there, turn it over and break it apart and you grab the worms out. And you can do that. Now, 
you can also grow your own worms as well. So you can build yourself worm boxes and you can use like old fence boards or old plywood or, or in a strand board that's that wafer board that costs $90 a sheet. Don't use that. Just get, get something free and cheap. <laughs> get that. Get yourself some dirt, get yourself comp compostable materials. So you can take like your old vegetable scraps and things like that. You can throw in a layer of those, layer of grass clippings, keep it wet. You put some worms in there to start and they will literally, they'll, they'll digest that and you want to keep it wet and kind of in the shade so that it doesn't dry out or anything. And you can grow your own bait. It's actually a lot of fun. We have a compost bin out in my garden area and we can shovel out of the bottom of that and we get all kinds of bugs. We got earwigs that come out of there and maggots and grubs and, and uh, worms and all kinds of stuff. And, and those are all suitable live baits. Live bait is live bait. As long as it's okay to use, you can use it, but worms work really good. So night crawlers, red worms, uh, meal worms, wax worms, all those different types of things. I, I, I couldn't display all of the different worms here in this one little area, but worms <laughs> in general, worms in general, there's nothing wrong with worms. They, they work great. Uh, the fish will eat them. They, it's a naturally occurring bait. Oftentimes, if you're fishing in a fishery where it's a self-reproducing fishery where the fish are wild, Worms are going to be one of the most effective ways, especially when strung under that bobber on one of those snell bait holders. You can just jig the bobber a little bit with that worm on it, that little bit of movement, and bang, you're getting pan fish like crazy. So worms are super effective. Now, along the lines of natural baits uh, that are out there, worms like sit up here in this little pinnacle up here because you can catch anything on worms. You can catch panfish, yeah. you can catch bass, you can catch trout, you can catch salmon and steelhead on them, you can catch sturgeon on them. People catch sturgeon on night crawlers, all that kind of stuff. Uh, you can catch gar on it and, and uh, musky and pike. They're not the, the most fun to use, but they'll eat it because it's there. You know, it's a natural bait. It's like, oh, what's this? Oh, it smells good. Bang. And they eat it and then it's all done and over with. But then we start looking at more specific types of baits for specific types of systems and different types a year, if you want to get real technical about it. Later on in the year in my region, we get more uh, of the terrestrial type bugs. So that's when we're talking about grasshoppers and crickets and dragonflies and things like that. Now, most people are, are pretty intimidated to grab certain types of bugs like that because they, you know, creepy crawly, you got antennas and all this other stuff, especially kids. But uh, a grasshopper or a cricket is a darn good bait. I, I'll tell you what, there's probably been more fish oh, yeah. act on, on a grasshopper or a cricket than you can even count. Even even uh, uh, wasps and hornets, if, if you got the nerve to go up and, and knock one of their, their nests out of the top of the barn, I watched my grandpa do it too. But I'll tell you what, a wasp or a hornet, those, those fish don't feel the sting in their mouth. They just hammer it. It's a bang gone. And, and those will catch fish. Uh, they, they do work extremely well. So those terrestrial little bugs that are out there, you can, you can totally use those. But a grasshopper and cricket, I, I don't know of a, of a terrestrial bug that's not more effective for fish. They just, they work so well. And, and it's, once again, it's naturally occurring. They'll sit there, they'll flutter on the surface. And it, there's just something about that wounded prey that, that turns a predatory fish on and they'll just erupt out of the water. They'll hit it. Or you put it on a hook under a bobber and, and a little bit of weight and you pin it down and it's like, oh, even easier meal. You know, that's like basically opening your mouth <laughs> and shoveling the plate into your mouth for the fish. Uh, you know, grasshoppers and crickets, you can go out and collect those yourself. You can go to the pet store and buy those. Some bait shops even sell them. They're a lot of fun to put on the hook and they work extremely well. Uh, in river systems that, that have salmon and steelhead around here or any other type of system that would have a fish that produces eggs, the, 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 the fish that produces the eggs will typically, they'll, they'll build a, a spawning nest and they spit the eggs out. And some of those eggs break free out of that spawn and they drift down. That becomes a natural food source. So one thing that we have is uh, we have uh, rainbow trout in our rivers and bull trout and brown trout and, and um, brook trout. And if the river permits it and you can use live bait, one of our favorite things to use are salmon eggs. Now you can get different types of egg mimickers. So you can get eggs that actually, that they look like that and they're a soft plastic. That's where we were talking about the beads. The beads look like those eggs and some of them are really big, some of them are tiny, but this is, th these are real salmon eggs. They've been cured. 
you can uh, make your own if you have access to catching salmon and getting your row. But these ones right here, you buy a jar down at the store for a couple bucks and you put those on a hook and they will catch fish. They, they work really well. Uh, I, won't, I won't talk about the brand here, but this works well. This is another form of what's considered to be a live bait just because it, it mimics a, a live uh, salmon fry or, or that, that salmon in that egg, you know, pre-hatch. Uh, category. So this is still considered to be a live bait, even though it's not a live alive. Uh, but, but salmon eggs work really good, or any type of fish egg mimicker works extremely well. Uh, different types of baits that work for fish that are, uh, that come from the ocean inland. So you can also use dead baits uh, that, that have already been used. So you can use uh, fish like herring or sardines. Now, in certain states, you can use live uh, chub or sucker minnows uh, that you can put on a live piece or a live fish. You go to a gas station, scoop it out, throw it in the bucket, you get yourself a dozen minnows, and you put one of those on a circle hook, fling it out there. You will catch fish on it because it's, it's a lot smaller, and you will get a big fish to vacuum it, or you'll catch turtles or, or anything else like that. So you're going to catch a plethora of different species, especially predatory species on those little live minnows. Some people use bluegill. You go out and you catch a bunch of bluegill and you hook it through the back, you fling it out there. Man, that's some of the best channel cat and flathead bait you can get. You know, you can use that as long as it's legally permitted. You can use crayfish, live crayfish, or, you know, here we have to kill them. We can pull out the tail meat, put it on a hook and throw it out. Now, in my opinion, I'd rather eat the crayfish, but, you know, if you wanted to run <laughs> that, that authentic bait, you could run that crayfish down the river. But on those ocean running fish, they, they got used to eating sardines, anchovies, uh, uh, herring, uh, they, they'll eat shrimp. So sand shrimp or ghost shrimp or coon shrimp or any of those types of shrimp, they'll eat those. Now, that's not to say a catfish won't either. A catfish, they'll, they'll, they'll take a tiger prawn right off a treble hook and, and you're, you're fight on. Same thing with a sturgeon. They'll take a sand shrimp and vacuum that thing up. So the, the, the shrimp are a great bait too. You get those at the tackle shop or you just go down to the seafood counter and you can get yourself some shrimp. You can even make your own cure. There's plenty of recipes online for that. So that encompasses kind of that live bait, dead bait thing of like the natural baits. But then there's also the synthetic baits as well. So we start talking about synthetic baits. So uh, like these guys here, I won't, I won't name brands once again, but uh, these ones are, are a nugget form of a dough bait. Uh, I don't have any dough bait per se, but these ones are a nugget. They just slide right on the hook. They're really easy for the kids to put on uh, and you can get a multitude of different colors. This one is rainbow. So if you can see that, it's got that nice rainbow appearance to it. So these, these types of nuggets that come in this form and there's a lot of different manufacturers of them. That's a great synthetic bait. Uh, they, they put the scent on there and everything else. And then they have uh, other types that uh, if you look there closely, um, this one, it's got, it's got something else in there with it. But uh, basically, that's another synthetic bait there. Uh, if you take a quick look at it, uh, these are scented up. You just slide that on the hook, pitch it out there, and you got bait on your hook, and the fish will come and suck it up. And then you have your dough baits as well and everything else. So there's a big selection of baits. This is what my suggestion would be, is to grab one of each of those baits. So grab a, a cup of worms, grab yourself a jar of salmon eggs, and get yourself either the nuggets or the egg form or the dough bait form of the synthetic bait. And if you got enough people out there fishing, put one of each on each hook and see which one works and which one catches fish. Once you figure out which one's catching fish, change all the hooks over to it and have everybody fish that until you're out of bait. So that's, that's, uh, you know, the gist of the live bait, you can get it yourself. You can do all kinds of other stuff, but, um, live bait, uh, it comes in a multitude of shapes and sizes. We could talk all day long about different ways to rig live bait, but, um, that's, that's the general gist of that. So you got anything to add to that, John, as far as the bait goes, man, uh, you covered it really well. Um, Crickets, they make cricket hooks. Mustad in particular makes specifically a cricket hook. It's a very long shank hook that I actually happen to have a couple down here. It's a very long shank hook with teeny tiny hook points. All right, so this supports the entirety of the body and this is what catches your fish, right? So these are size 10. These are really affordable. 
I'm not saying you can't put a cricket on a snail, but I'm saying those are made for crickets. All right. Mm-hmm. So you know, like we were saying before, each hook has its own purpose. Uh, you don't you don't have to have a cricket hook. I'm just saying they they exist. All right. I didn't know. For long. Minnows, like you said, fantastic. Uh, and, and just to reiterate how he said, uh, if you can fish live bait, okay, there are some fisheries where you cannot use live bait, okay? Do not get caught using live bait in a place you cannot. Uh, uh, we don't say this very often, but a game warden can take literally everything from you. A game warden has way more authority than a lot of people give them credit for. If they're having a bad day and you're doing something really bad, they can take your truck, they can seize your property, they can send you straight to jail. It's no ifs, ands, or buts. Game wardens can absolutely mess you up. So do what's right legally, do what's right morally, and uh, make sure you can use your live bait. And that's all I got on the live bait piece. You got yeah. on that one, Brian? Yeah, yeah, I am. Uh, I, I think just echoing that sediment, make sure that you follow all your regulations because there's a lot of bo- water bodies, especially in the West, that are artificial and fly, uh, artificial lure and fly only. And, and that's it. And so uh, I imagine that's the case also with uh, uh, a lot of places in the South and the East Coast, the Northeast, uh, Midwest. Uh, not you're you're not going to be able to roll up to every river river system and be able to throw in live bait. You're going to have to go with that artificial fly and lure. There's going to be leader length restrictions, barb restrictions, float restrictions. Uh, there's all kinds of stuff in it. And the amount all, of rods you can carry. Oh yeah, yeah. Carry yeah. versus use versus have available to your disposal. Uh, the the rules are very vast, and you really have to you have to be very literate and research those. So yeah, that's, that's all that I had on that live bait part. Um, you want to jump into flies a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to. So flies, um, I am just about only a fly fisherman anymore. And it's not for lack of love for every species of fish. It's just, I, I, I find it the most relaxing and the most rewarding. So I talk to a lot of fly guys, right? No, no, don't get me wrong. If I'm fishing for food or I'm fishing for bass, I'm using conventional gear most of the time. But uh, I talk to a lot of fly guys. You know, Brian's a fly guy to an extent himself. You know, Brian, Brian's a really well-balanced angler, by the way. And uh, I, to- I, I, I talk to a lot of strictly fly guys. And... Uh, one of them is a fantastic Euro nymph. I'm sure he'll come on to the show sometime and just blow y'all's minds with the way he thinks about stuff because he's out of the box and uh, he's awesome. Maybe we'll get him on here. But yeah, I was talking to him last night, right? And uh, he said, uh, I'm not going to say everything he said because uh, I, I, I appreciate it more if he said it. But what he did say is people get it all messed up. He said, they think you need all these different kinds of flies and all these different kind of intricate patterns and things like that. Now, part of fly fishing is the artistry of it. And that's the same with fly tying. Some people enjoy tying really intricate and beautiful flies. But I'm going to let you know that you don't need a really beautiful and intricate fly all the time because those are expensive. They take a lot of time to tie. They take a lot of materials. They're going to be expensive. If I had to pick five flies and just five flies to catch panfish bass and trout on just five flies it would be a woolly bugger you uh there's an absolute insane amount of woolly buggers uh colors that you could uh, use and there's different patterns there's uh, really really heavy woolly buggers and all this other stuff but the, the he told me specifically last night he said there's not a single fish that wouldn't eat a woolly bugger because I told him I was tying a box for a guy that's brand new to fly fishing. The guy said, Hey, I want X amount of dollars with any amount of patterns, but I'm brand new. So I'd really like a big assortment of flies if possible. So I I sent my buddy the list and he was like, how do you not have a woolly bugger on there? He said, you might not catch a ton of fish, but there is literally always a fish willing to eat a woolly bugger. And he's a Euro nipper. And he'll tell you, and he, he told me that straight up. 
So, and then you know, one of mine and Brian's favorite flies, I believe, is it's a pheasant tail nymph. Okay. A pheasant tail nymph will catch everything. There's, there, there's not a trout in, in the world that wouldn't eat a pheasant tail nymph. Now, maybe he doesn't want it right now, but I bet his buddy does. All right. You can't go wrong with the pheasant tail. And then um, we can get into some colors, but really any pheasant tail color is going to work. I, I think browns, olives, and black and red are probably three of the top producing colors. Woolly buggers, uh, black, olive, and purple, believe it or not, are three really heavily producing colors. Um, and you don't need, you don't have to have flash in the tail on your buggers either. A simple bugger might just be perfect for what they want. All right. Um, I'll get into a fun fact after this. All right. Brian, don't let me get off too far off track here. Uh, the third one would be a dry fly. Okay. Uh, I'd say a gnat. I do not know a fish species that will not eat. I think they'd probably even eat one. I've caught cat. Catfish. I'm making a note out there right now. <clears throat> this guy called me. And uh, I, I gave him like five or six flies maybe six months ago. You know, sh shortly after. After I started tying flies and my box was full with a bunch of flies I didn't need. A bunch of all right we had a little bit of a stream breakdown and i think we're back y'all so i'm we ain't sure exactly where it broke up but gnats gnats will catch everything i've even called catfish on gnats i don't know a fish except maybe bass that won't eat a gnat okay um anything from size 10 the first river trail i ever caught was on a size 10 gnat that's a big gnat. I ain't never seen a gnat that's a size 10, but uh, they ate it. You know what I mean? So um, and to get off track here, I already made a note to come back. So I tied a bunch of really bad flies when I started tying flies, like the worst, probably. And uh, I gave six of the best ones I had tied probably half a year ago to uh, a buddy at work for him to go throw up in Arkansas uh, to try to catch some of what one, some fish we couldn't identify from a video, but there were tons of them. And uh, he ended up catching a bunch of those. But yesterday he called me and I tied one teleco nymph uh, in that box. And he caught, uh, he wasn't joking either. I thought he was just, you know, yanking my chain. He caught 12 catfish. The biggest was a pound. They weren't huge or nothing. He caught 12 catfish yesterday on a teleco nymph, a size 10 teleco nymph. So uh, I, was, I was in shock, you know, but uh, you can catch all kinds of species on flies, but that's a topic for a different time. I, I, I just, I had to share that because I, I don't think I told you that yesterday, but all right. So woolly bugger, pheasant tail nymph, gnat, these next two, okay. We'll, we'll do two plus one because i think one needs to be on here also a soft tackle okay you can there is no fly box complete without a soft tackle they are inexpensive and they are effective soft tackles who knows what they actually mimic but uh people think that it mimics small bait fish or that it mimics a mayfly nymph or a stonefly nymph or who knows what the fish think it is but i can tell you that fish eat it all right Soft tackles are excellent flies. And then the next dry I would recommend would be a cripple. A cripple in several different colors. If you had to pick uh, blue wing olive, done, March brown, and maybe even just a straight black. All those colors, were, they're going to catch fish. They are absolutely going to catch fish. I know I've, I've watched Brian catch uh, sl absolute slab gills on cripple blooming olives, mm -hmm. like giant panfish. I, I've I've never seen him catch the trout because when he's out there slaying on the drift boat, I don't think he's got time to pull out his phone and be like, "Hey, John, look, dude." <laughs> <You know? laughs> but uh, 
that the, all those five right there, they catch fish. They, they outright will catch fish from just about every species. I've caught bass um, even on a cripple. Uh, the, the added bonus one would be a hare's ear. Okay. It's another nymph. And then there's hare's ears with, you know, soft hackles. And then you got like waltz worms and things like that. But a hare's ear is another really good. Uh, if you had to replace one, I would replace the soft hackle with a hare's ear and those back and forth, however you want to do it. But those would be the five flies I would not go without in my box. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and uh, the, the the selection of flies that that John just pointed out, they will work in lakes and they will work in rivers, and that's one of the cool parts. They'll work lakes, ponds, rivers. Basically, those those five different patterns will work universally across anywhere, um, and and they're commonly available. When you get deeper into the weeds, then you can start talking about like um mop flies and you can talk about um you know um streamers and things like that but just as the beginning fly fisher uh stick to those five and you won't have any trouble at all getting into fish if you it, it alleviates a lot of confusion as you get more confident and proficient then you can start working on matching the hatch you can you know cover all of those different types of things those those five different fly patterns though will pretty much cover you anywhere you want to fish uh and as long as the fish are feeding and they're active that you will get fish on those flies whether you want to sit there on the surface with the dry with the cripples like the blue wing olives or the uh, pmds a pale morning dun or the blue duns or uh you know anything like that or you want to fish uh uh you know the stream or the 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 sinking flies like the woolly buggers or or what we would call like leech patterns things like that there's there's a whole bunch of different ones but for the beginning fly angler those five right there that that's going to get it done and you don't have to spend an arm and a leg on flies you could go into a fly shop and make yourself sick with some of the cost but uh with with what you're looking at there uh, you can you can get yourself going for you know 20 25 bucks and you got enough flies to go out and have fun on the lake for uh, you know a weekend even uh, just because of the fact that you're not losing flies like crazy unless you're around a lot of trees or bushes or they are getting to the bottom and snagging up and you know you, you can even buy i'm gonna tell you, you can buy a bunch of really cheap flies okay and if you can find someone that ties for an affordable price, I'd recommend doing that because those flies are generally going to last up a little bit longer. Uh, your production fly tying guys, they're going to tie up a whole bunch of flies for a pretty, pretty good price. All right. Um, you can buy from your fly shops. That's fine. I ain't telling you not to do that. I ain't telling you to only support small business. Do whatever you damn well please. Remember, this is America. And uh, But you can order really cheap flies from online. Now, I'm going to tell you, they ain't going to last forever. You can end up with just a hook. At some point, you're going to end up paying a dollar for just a size 10 hook because all your hackle and everything is just going to be blown off that hook. And uh, do you want to pay a dollar for a hook or do you want to pay $2 for a fly? That's your decision. All right. That's just a little bit of advice, a little bit of food for thought. Well, that's all I got on flies, except that, uh, you know, Brian said, match the hatch, match the hatches. Uh, that's a, it's a real thing. You know, people have been saying that for years, but at the same time, there's a lot of people that have kind of been disproving it. Just be, let's just say there's a size 16 mayfly hatch coming off right now in March Brown. Well, I don't have a size 16 March Brown dry. Uh, well, I'm going to throw a, a pale morning dine in size 16 and I bet it's going to get eaten. Mm -hmm. All right. Just, just try to find something generally around the same size. It doesn't have to be the same color. Don't be so obsessed and be like, Oh my, first off, if you're new and you can identify all these insects, good for you because I've been doing this a while and I still ain't figured out what, hardly any of these are so yeah so <laughs> you gotta go out there with a turkey baster and a book and start sucking you know scuds yeah. out of the bottom or chronomids and you know putting them on a you know looking at them under a microscope you're not going to be able to do that you can get a general idea like if 
if we have a salmon fly hatch, you just know that you're going to eat big bugs. You can throw big foam imitators and they just come up and blow up the surface. They'll eat beetles and chubby Chernobyls and all the, all these other flies that, you know, you're like, God, they're just naming off all these flies. We just know what they are, but you'll, you'll get to that proficiency as well. But yeah, man, that's all I got on flies. Keep it simple. It's like plastics, man. Few colors, mm -hmm. few sizes. I know we didn't really get into sizes, but real quick, I'll give you a size that I would do for each of these. And uh, th this depends on your location. I fish for panfish a lot. Okay. Keep that in mind. Uh, I don't have trout fisheries really close to me. Uh, so when I tie these flies for myself, these are the sizes I tie. I tie size 10 woolly buggers. Size 10 catches panfish, ties, size 10 catches bass. I also tie them in size 12. We're, we're back to that size 12 to size eight thing again remember th those are those sizes that kind of catch everything okay uh pheasant tail nymph uh size 14 is what i like in my pheasant tail uh gnats uh believe it or not i like throwing them in size 20 uh size 20 is hard to tie on if you got old eyes all mm -hmm. right or if you got bad eyesight and I don't mean old eyes as a derogative term. I'm just saying, uh, if you got bad eyesight like yours truly, it's kind of hard to tie those on. So I either throw them in size 10 or size 16, okay? Um, my soft tackles, I will tie from size 20 uh, all the way up to size 10. But the one I like the best is, once again, a size 14. I like size 14 soft tackles. And then for my cripple dries... And, it's, it's called a cripple, by the way, because it, it's, it's a crippled fly. That's why the wings look all crazy, because they didn't hatch right, okay? Uh, cripples, I tie in size 16 as well. Size 16 is perfect for panfish, and it's perfect for trout. Uh, that's pretty much, if you can get in, any of these flies in a size 14 or 16, except for your buggers. Your buggers, you want a little bit bigger, because bass will eat them, and bigger fish will eat them. Uh, 14 and 16, solid size. It's easy to see. Uh, it's a good size for pretty much every fish too. You got anything for that, Brian? Yeah, I think I, the the sizes uh, really important. You know, just get the right size. You'll 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 get the fish. Um, you know, you shouldn't have too many issues with all that stuff. I think uh, you know, just having a good selection of the different sizes and and shapes and everything else. Uh, as long as it looks buggy and they're feeding off the surface, typically they're going to hit it. You know, unless they're real smart and they're real selective. At that point, uh, then then the puzzle gets a little bit tougher to put together. But uh, if they're pretty indiscriminate, they're hungry, they're going to hit the top uh, like a like a panfish will. Uh, they're, they're just going to come up erupt and bang, you know, and there's going to be a fish on the end of your line and you're going to, you're going to set your hook on your first one. You'll be in the fly fishing after that, for sure. Um, I, I think that's, you know, th that's, that's the biggest thing. Match the size, you know, as close as you can, uh, smaller sometimes produces better, bigger sometimes produces better than smaller. It just all depends on the time of year and what's happening. Yeah. That, that's another thing. Don't, don't listen to them guys. They're like, well, if something ain't biting put on a bigger bait. Uh, well, there is, my grandfather always said, if you want to catch a big fish, you got to use a big bait. And there's a lot of truth to that, but that with fly fishing, that's a little, uh, bass backwards, if you will. Um, because big fish sometimes want that size 24. Okay. Um, don't, don't be that guy that only thinks, Oh, well, I got to go bigger you you, you got to understand that sometimes they're feeding little all right and i think that's i think we're good on flies now yeah so so we were sorry i got cat hair in my mouth we were talking about raising your own bait right brian touched on that with the worms thing you know go outside get you some worms and uh tear up some newspaper all right uh there is the ink in the newspaper which some people say is bad for the worms, but uh, it, it probably is a little bad for the worms in a sense, but I'm using them as bait. So I don't think they care, you know? Uh, but if you are real keen on that and you're like, well, I want to give them the best life I can until I go fish with them. Uh, they make worm bedding that you can get for $5 at tractor supply. Yep. All right. So uh, I say tractor supply, cause that's what we got around here, but any of your farm or your farm stores, your co-ops, your ACE hardware is anything like that. Mm -hmm. They're going to have worm bedding uh, for affordable prices, okay? 
Uh, you can look up real quick online what worms can and cannot eat. Uh, there are some things that worms should not eat, like uh, egg yolks. They can eat the shells, but you, they can't eat the yolks. It'll kill them. All right, so just look into that. I, I would recommend uh, millworms are incredibly easy. Uh, they have different stages. Uh, they have a beetle form. And then when they're a worm is when they're the larva. And you'll actually raise them. And you'll see them do both uh, stages of their life within that box you're feeding them in. But they are incredibly simple. Millworms are so simple. I think they're even easier than night crawlers. Because millworms, all you need is mill, and they're going to eat the mill. You cut up some apples or you cut up some potatoes, put it on the top. That's it. Once a week, go change out their food, go flip them a little bit, and they're good to go. Millworms are so easy to raise. Uh, night crawlers or other, other worms, they, they take a little bit more work, um, but I think they grow at a much more rapid pace. And I do think they catch more fish. Uh, they take a little bit more uh, tending. You, you've got to flip the beds. You got to make sure that it's wet, but it can't be wet from the worms. Um, that's why you flip the beds. Uh, my dad raised his in uh, cut glue boxes, so he had a spout to drain all the worm juice. All right, because worm juice for worms is bad for them. After a long time, it'll kill them. Right, so. Just keep that in mind. And a little bit more work, a little bit more homework, but uh, they grow faster and they catch a whole bunch of fish. Um, minnows. Minnows are kind of hard to raise. Uh, I think you also have to have licenses in some states to do so. Um, you need clean water, you need aerated water, and you need cold water. All right. And then you got to figure out how to feed them and all that stuff. So uh, if I was going to say you're starting out raising your own bait, and I ain't talking about to sell to people, I'm talking about for you, yourself, or your family, uh, I do night crawlers, mealworms. So now we're going to kind of get into the simplicity of fishing lures. Okay. Um, you, you, you're going to hear me say this over the course of however long we do this podcast, you don't need. Okay. Uh, you don't need a bunch of different lures. That's why we gave you five plastics. You know, three plastics, five colors. That's why we gave you five flies with a few colors. You don't need a ton of baits to catch fish. Don't go to the tackle store and be like, it, it's easy to do. It is so easy to do to walk into the tackle aisle somewhere, or if it's a, if it's a Bass Pro or a Cabela's, and it's nothing but fishing stuff. It is so easy to spend more money than you want. It, it, it's like going to the grocery store hungry. You're looking around and you're like, oh, that looks good. You put, put it in your buggy. Oh, that looks good. You put it in your buggy. And then you get home and by the time you check out, you're, you're, you're sick with yourself because, well, dang, this is probably more than I needed. Well, you can do the same thing with fishing tackle. And people tell you, no, you can't have too much fishing tackle. And no, you probably can't, but at some point you got to carry that stuff around. All right. So keep it really simple. And that, that's what we're meaning by the simplicity of fishing lures. All right. Uh, if you're going to get moving baits like crankbaits, get you a square bill, get you a shallow runner, get you a deep diver, get a good bait fish pattern get you a good crawl pattern and get you a shad pattern. They'll catch fish. All right. You don't need 15 different color crankbaits to get it done. And that's what I mean by the simplicity. And if, if you're, if you're making your own baits, um, you, you don't need 15 different colors of glitter and in your plastics, you just don't, the fish don't care. Yeah, the glitter is going to attract some bites, but you don't need, well, I need green pumpkin blue, green pumpkin red, green pumpkin orange, green pumpkin green. You don't need all that, all right? Just get green pumpkin and be content with it. Fishing is as simple as you make it or as complex as you make it. Don't, don't get so wrapped up in, oh, I need all this stuff. Fish within your budget and keep it simple. Keep it as simple as you can. 
until you figure out if it's something you really want to do. Or if you've already figured that out and you're like, man, I love fishing, then start doing more homework. It's more beneficial to understand how certain bait colors will react in certain amount of sunlight, uh, what colors produce in what locations more frequently than others, knowing how fish, uh, fish patterns, knowing uh, atmospheric conditions, things like that. Learn those, and then you'll be able to learn what bait. I can't snap with my left hand, but snap. You know, uh, period. You, you learn all that other stuff, and you'll be able to figure out what baits you need. Keep it simple, though. Don't, don't, don't get so wrapped up. It's so easy to go out there and spend way too much money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and <clears throat> you know, John touched on an important point. The lures that you can buy. They, they look cool. Trust me, there's, there's so many out there. But you will find that they all do the same thing, regardless of color, regardless of shape or manufacture. You, you, could, you could take one type of inline spinner up against another type of inline spinner, and both of them are going to catch the fish as long as it's in front of the fish. That's, that's the bottom line. Same thing with a crankbait. You could take cheaper crankbait, put it up against a really expensive crankbait, and you're probably going to get similar results. Now, I'm not going to say that the durability isn't going to be different between those. That, that's not what I'm saying. Because when you do buy something that's uh, a little bit more, you're probably going to get a little bit better durability. But if you're looking for affordability, basic affordability, uh, a lot of those crankbaits that are out there, you know, the spinners that are out there, the spinner baits, jerk baits, um, all that kind of stuff, that's you're you're going to get what you pay for basically in 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 that respect but to get started out you don't have to buy everything in the shop you know uh there's there's just so many different ways uh, that that you can go my best suggestion to add on to what john was saying there is is go out and and see what other people are using lure wise and keep keep your lure selection to a very narrow um color scheme or style and and then go from there you don't have to have every single color of that style of lure you can go and you can get a couple good effective colors you know whatever everybody else is throwing and and catching fish on and you can go out there and join in typically um you know colors and things like that they're they're you know that i i believe personally that some of that is is true that that it helps with light refraction and it and it helps uh, with the visibility of the lure underwater, depending on the way that the sun's hitting the water or the water clarity or the turbulence in the water, the, the fish species you're targeting, so on and so forth. But I think it's more of the action of the physical lure itself. And yeah, sometimes some of those more expensive lures are going to have a, a better action uh, or, you know, this, this type of lure versus this type of lure is going to just work better because of the way that it moves through the water. That's, that's a lot of it, you know, it, it looks more real than this one, but there's nothing to say that you can, still couldn't go down and, uh, you know, get the, the five pack of whatever that's, that's maybe the same price as two of the other expensive ones and not catch fish. You can, you can still plan on catching fish and, and lures are just cool anyways, you know, they're, they're one of those cool things. And, uh, you know, the, the, the better your arsenal of lures, uh, the better, the you know, the, the better chance you have, but you don't have to go out and break the bank on lures. You might, you might try a few of this and a few of that and just kind of go from there. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. So, you know, I think John, man, we've, we've talked about everything we got, you know, we got quality versus quantity here is kind of the last point. And we kind of talked about that in the beginning. And I, and I, uh, I think about that in, in a lot of different ways. And, and we were just talking about that in regards to the lures and things like that. And I, I'll, I'll kind of fill in here. You do get what you pay for. And um, obviously affordability is a big deal. Uh, I think, I think, I think for it to be affordable and accessible to the people that, that are out there angling, you're going to sacrifice one for the other. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say that, uh, you know, you're, 
you're going to get tons of life out of a 15 or $20 rod combination, or even, you know, your, your monofilament line, it, it does need to be replaced every year. You're not going to get five years out of it. Now I'm, I'm not saying that it wouldn't still catch fish. It's just going to get worse and it's going to get nasty and that, and that memory in it and everything else, it's going to, it's going to get worse. But if, if you are just getting started out angling and you're using a very cheap combo right now, keep using it. Don't stop. But if you're really, really, really getting into fishing quite a bit, step up to the next thing. Maybe not, you don't have to fly all the way to the top. You're not going to start out with the $5 or $10, you know, big box store combo, and then go down to the fishing shop and buy the $350 spin or bait cast rod. That's just a rod. And then the $300 bait casting or spinning reel. You know, you're not, you're not going to jump to that, but you could go up to the next thing. And that next thing could be all you need for a long time. And you could get a lot of fishing pleasure out of it. You could, you get by with one rod. That's the thing is like, you can, you can take any one of these combos and get by with one rod or maybe two rods, depending on what you want to do. Um, if you want a spin rod, a bait cast rod and a fly rod, you get by with three rods, depending on what you want to fish for. As you, as you get more into fishing, you'll add a rod here and there, a rod reel combination. You'll add, you know, more tackle, obviously. And you're going to find that there's different types of tackle that do different things. And you're going to find the ones that you like. And so you'll get this big selection and then it'll start to really narrow down. And that's one of the biggest things. So quality is really going to be dependent on, on a couple different things. And quality isn't tied to price by any means. I think that's a big misconception. Quality is tied to, uh, number one, the durability of the product. And more expensive or, or, or a higher cost product doesn't necessarily mean it's going to last better. I bought new vehicles and in 30,000 miles had the transmission take a dump. Okay. That's, that's, you know, and, and when you talk about a new vehicle, 25, 30, 35, $45,000, right? Uh, and, and you'll hear people say, well, that's a cheap new vehicle. Well, I want to know where you're just going to go and whip out a checkbook and write it, you know, <laughs> all that money away for that. Yeah. You know, that's, that's, that's kind of a dumb statement to make. So, you know, you go out and you, let's say you buy a 70 to a hundred dollar rod and reel combination. That, that's actually a fairly costly rod and reel combination compared to some of the cheaper ones that you get at the big box stores that get people started out. Well, you can go and play with the reels and you can feel the rod and everything else. And, and two, two big things that happen with that. Number one, you're going to notice that on the expensive reels, when you're reeling, if you come back it, 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 and, it, and it doesn't come back, you got pretty tight gears in there. It's pretty good. Now it could be a $30 reel. Nothing wrong with that. Now you can pick up that combination and reel with it and it goes to clunk backwards. Well, not as tight of gears in it, not as great of a reel. You can take a look at a good rod and you're like, man, that rod look, feels really good. I love the cork handle or the foam handle or the, you know, carbon fiber looking handle, whatever you want. You can look at that rod and you're like, okay, that one's 30 bucks. This reel's 30 bucks. They'll work with each other. I got a $60 combo that I built myself and, it, and it's good enough quality for me to be able to go out and fish and feel good about it. Put some new line on there, 75 bucks. You walk out the door and you got a good rod combo. It's not going to be the $400 one sitting down at the far end of the rack with, with a $350 reel because you go feel that reel and that rod and you go feel that 60, you know, that $60 combo versus the $500 combo. And you're like, I don't really feel a difference. The, the feeling comes with a lot of time and experience, not necessarily just based on what you get on surface value. So that quality versus the quantity thing, you don't need a whole bunch of stuff or expensive stuff you know, quantity of cash versus quality isn't going to make a difference. Now, quantity of things <laughs> that you can get into uh, there again, that's going to be time. That's time under the hood. That's time on the bank. That's time fishing. And, and you'll find out what you like. I, I have my fly selection narrowed down. I, I have like three or four of my favorite dry patterns. I got about two or three good nymph patterns. I have uh, a couple of good streamer patterns and, and, and some good woolly bugger patterns that I fish with, um, you know, and, and that's what I go to. Like I keep one rod tied up with the most basic parachuting dry fly that I can find. And that's usually the first one I dump in a river because it's the most buggy looking thing and it catches fish. 
I usually, when I go down to the, the, uh, the river or something like that, I'll have one rod with a basic old inline spinner on it and the other one rigged up to fish some other stuff. You know, that's, that's it. You know, if, if I go out bass fishing, I'll have a soft plastic rod and I'll have a lure rod. In the lure rod, I can either put a spinner bait on or a crank bait, or I can do anything like that. Now, some guys might say, well, you need a spinner bait rod and a crank bait rod. And I, I fish it all on one rod. You don't have to have a rod for each one, unless you really want that, then you go, go for it. You know, it's free country. You do whatever you want, but I, I keep it down because I don't want to carry 15 rods <laughs> when I go down to the, <laughs> the river, I, I, two or three already looks kind of crazy. People are like, wow, you really come geared up. I'm like, oh. I just hate tying stuff on that's and that's really what it is so i'm just like i hate tying untying tying untying that or you know clip this undo this dig it through my bag i'd rather just be fishing so i go out there fish 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 i i hit it with this and i'm like okay well maybe there's something over there i'll get it to go with a with a spinner or whatever you know and just go from there whatever i feel like fishing that day or trying or whatever else but yeah you don't need you don't need 100 rods you you know maybe one or two that, that's all you need one one for sure just so you go <laughs> yeah you just need one so you go fishing and uh kind of get get the bug and get the gist of it and just go out there chuck some bait and put it under a bobber ain't nothing wrong with that you can catch fish yeah now that that was really well said you know you know just exactly what he's saying is you, you don't need a lot you just need enough and uh, that's kind of what i wanted to hit on on the whole quality versus quantity thing you just need enough all right enough to get out there on the water and enough to catch fish all right and you can catch fish on very minimal gear really minimal gear and and i'm gonna tell you i'm gonna straight up tell you bass fishermen a lot of them real good dudes fly fishermen a lot of them real good dudes but there's there's assholes everywhere it don't matter what you're doing don't matter if it's at work don't matter if you're at the park don't matter if you're at grandma's house you're gonna find some family there that's just rude all right there's assholes everywhere don't let them keep you down all right well you know how people say oh it's a graduation from spin cast to bait cast no it ain't it's just a different way of fishing all right don't don't let someone be like oh what what rod is that? I don't know how much is it. It don't matter how much it is. It matters how it feels. If that's all you can afford, and that's and that's what you're going out with, don't be ashamed of that. Mm -hmm. And if they're asking that, they're assholes. It don't matter how much that is unless they're interested in buying it themselves. All right? And you can tell real quick if someone's just trying to put you down or if someone's generally interested. All right? Fish your gear. Be proud of your gear and just get out there and fish, man. You don't need a lot. You just need enough. All right. And I think that's all I got, man. Yeah, I think, I think uh, we've summarized this. This has been a, another uh, fun topic to get into because, man, gear is just the, the never-ending abyss. It's like, you know, Alice in Wonderland. You go down a rabbit hole and <laughs> you're going to be wandering around for a while. But nonetheless, I, I, I'm really happy that we were able to get together and uh, really talk about this. I, I hope all of you find this to be a, a great primer, a good informative podcast uh, uh especially this episode to get you out there on the on the, the river or the lake or wherever you're fishing at get out there and, and wet a line if you need help with uh figuring out anything uh as far as you know what combo do i need to get or i'm fishing for this fish or anything i'll shoot john or myself a message we're more than happy to give you a hand we want to help you get get off the ground and get out there and enjoy fishing and you know if you're if you're getting maybe a little bit bewildered about regulations or the language is confusing or anything like that you know let us know what state you're in we'll take a look at them because we got you know we we may have to do a, a fishing vocabulary episode here <laughs> where where we can go through this you know where where we're talking about oh artificial flying lure except for you know soft plastics not artificial you know but we'll we'll have to talk about that a little bit because uh legal languages can be difficult or if you're just not getting the help uh, you you know you're going you're going down to your local tackle shop and you're getting snubbed or you know you're maybe maybe you just don't 
really feel comfortable talking to people and, and that's totally fine too, but you feel comfortable like shooting a text or a line or anything else like that, shoot us a text, shoot us a line. It can be very brief and simple. We're, we're all about helping everybody out. It doesn't matter. You know, this is, this is the all inclusive thing that everybody can get into. Uh, we, we really like um, to help people out. That's, that's why we're doing this. So shoot us a line. Uh, remember you can find us on Instagram at, um, at the working class fishing. You can find us on YouTube at working, uh, uh, the Working Class Fishing Podcast, uh, and, and you, we're going to have a lot of instructional and how-to videos up there. I know there's a lot of them out there, but it's us doing it, so uh, you, know, you, can, you can come and check out you know, what John and I do and, and how we do it. I, you know, there's always a different way to skin a cat. Uh, you can email us at workingclassfish at gmail.com. Uh, you can also message us on any one of the podcast platforms. Uh, uh, at least you can on Anchor if you would like to message us. But please feel free. Tell your friends once again. Tell them about this podcast. Let us know what you're thinking of what we're doing and what we're talking about. We, we always invite new ideas. And if you have a guest suggestion, please shoot that over to us too. So with that, I'm going to say, have a great day. Get out there, do some fishing. John. Thanks for coming by. I appreciate it. And y'all have an excellent day. <laughs> All right. Thanks again for listening. <laughs>